can be done about it? A House panel hears from child health and outdoor recreation groups. This hearing is about two and a half hours. Let me call the uh, Joint Oversight uh, Committee hearing of the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forest and Public Lands and the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife and Oceans uh, to an oversight hearing, uh, No Child Left Inside, Reconnecting Children with Nature. Thank you very much and I want to welcome everyone to this joint oversight hearing on the importance of nature in children's lives. Our witnesses have worked hard to prepare testimony and to be with us today and we thank them for their efforts. It is also my pleasure to welcome colleagues from the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife and Oceans. The issues we, we will discuss today affect both agencies and programs within the jurisdiction of both subcommittees and we look forward to a good discussion. Some of our children will become as adult, what, what our children will become as adult depends on genetic makeup and some will be the result of life experience. We will likely never declare a winner in this nature versus nurture uh, debate. One thing for certain is that for human beings and children in particular, nature is nurture and America's youth need more of it. Time spent outdoors during childhood, whether it is hiking Yosemite or fishing in the creek behind your house fosters creativity, self-confidence, family bonding, better health, not to mention the beginnings of scientific and environmental curiosity. It also fosters a conservation ethic that will be so critical to ensuring the long-term stewardship of our natural world. Competition for young people's time and attention is tougher now than it had ever been before, and there is mounting evidence that the kind of unstructured outdoor exploration many of us remember as children is losing out to indoor electronic entertainment. In too many instances, adventure games are replacing actual adventure in children's lives. We face the possibility that a child who might have grown up to, to be the next Teddy Roosevelt or Rachel Carson is inside right now playing Grand Theft Auto instead. Today's panelists will discuss current efforts to document and address this trend as well as the impacts these developments are having on America's young people. In addition, we welcome our witnesses' thoughts on what it might mean for the future of our parks, forests, oceans, refuge, and other public lands if the next generation of Americans has little or no interest in visiting or protecting them. More important, we look to them for recommendations on how our federal resource agencies can play a role in reversing this trend. Once again, we thank our witnesses for their energy and effort, and I would like turn to our ranking member Bishop for any opening comments that he may have. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I am intrigued by the title of today's hearing and hope it brings better results than the uh, fatally flawed No Child Left Behind education program of the federal government. Our witnesses will point out the obvious that children today need more exercise and time outdoors. Although there may be consensus on this fact, the role of the federal government solving this challenge is entirely another question. Some witnesses will testify the federal government should provide even more money to buy private land so that kids have more outdoor recreation opportunities. I am a living case study of how people coming from states with vast public land ownership can indeed be overweight. I'll also challenge all those who will be talking. Be careful what you say about, over, about obesity today. I am very sensitive about it. The federal government already owns one-third of the lands in the United States and as Congress appropriates more money for land acquisitions, kids are becoming more obese. So let us not overlook the role the private sector can play in providing vast outdoor recreation opportunities in this country. Today we'll hear from Alan Lambert with the Boy Scouts of America, which owns thousands of acres of its own land, which has been used to train millions of kids to appreciate the great outdoors. The Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico alone has over 120,000 acres, or roughly three times the land area of Washington, D.C., and if many of the largest and the loudest national environmental groups would spend less money focusing on politics, they too could follow the sterling example of the Boy Scouts and use their tax-free largesse to buy lands for kids to, con to reconnect with nature. Boy Scouts example of private conservation is being replicated throughout this nation by electric utilities, timber, timber companies, ranches, campgrounds and other private enterprises that are providing outdoor recreation under the free enterprise system. At a time when our existing national parks, forests and refuges face a vast backlog of maintenance and rehabilitation progress, uh, progress, projects, I'm sorry, it is vital that we encourage the policies that allow the private sector to continue its outstanding work in this regard. Thank you, I yield back.
Would anyone else wish to make an opening statement? Just a quick one, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. This is, um, um, I think this is a wonderful hearing. I think just the conversation, just the discussion about America's future, which is our children, and how are they nurtured, and how are they raised, and how are they exposed to this um, fascinating, majestic, dangerous world. Um, so I would say that, uh, and, and the chairman used the word unstructured, which is, I think, so vital here. Uh, when many of us in this room grew up in the 40s and the 50s, there was virtually no structure for children, other than the parents and the grandparents and the community. But you were outside, uh, and with even a sandlot, the universe was at your fingertips through your imagination. Um, and it was baseball, and it was horseshoes, and it was hiking, and it was canoeing, and it was exploring. You could climb an apple tree, and you would end up on the other side of the universe. And all of these unstructured, vastly important things that kids could figure out in their small, small, tiny world, uh, without the structure, without the cell phones, without the computers, without the games, without all those things, even without organized baseball, Little League, or all those things. And even, and I was a Boy Scout leader, even without the Boy Scout, because you always had an adult telling you what to do. The kids could go on their own Star Trek um, to the Amazon jungle, to the Rocky Mountains, to the other side of Pluto. And in doing that, herein lies the idea that um, can regenerate a generation and for generations to come, and that's brain development. We all know about neurons and their connections and how it works and evolves, and you make up a new cell every time you think a new thought. So the confidence, the independent thinking, the initiative, the ingenuity, the intellect that arises in an enormous fashion just by a child, children on their own, figuring things out with their brains, with their fingers, with their motions, with their laughter, and all of that happens outside. It's really a responsibility of adults to figure out how we can regenerate um, that lost art. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. And let me uh, welcome the first panel. Appreciate uh, your presence. Looking forward to uh, your comments. And uh, at the outset, let me just uh, indicate that all, all the all your testimony uh, it will be accepted in its entirety, your written testimony into the record. And if uh, at all possible, we would like uh, the oral presentation to be uh, five minutes. And uh, with that, let me begin with uh, Mr. James Kaysen, Associate Deputy Secretary, the Department of Interior. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before your subcommittees today to discuss efforts to reconnect children with the outdoors. Secretary Kempthorne has highlighted the significance of this issue and its relevance to the Department of the Interior's mission. Connecting children with the outdoors can affect their health, enhance their knowledge of our environment, and strengthen their commitment to environmental stewardship. We affirm these goals and the role the department plays in advancing them. In September 2006, the Secretary invited more than 300 educators, health professionals, business leaders, and conservationists to participate in a national dialogue on children and nature. The inaugural conference focused on the positive impact nature can have on the health, conservation awareness, and the character development of children, the positive and negative impacts of technology, media, and the built environment on children's connection to nature, and what can be done to restore the connection between children and the outdoors. At the conference, the Secretary stated, we are here today to light a fire of passion that opens the doors to the great outdoors so that children can see and hear and smell and taste and touch nature. Government can be a catalyst, an encourager, a motivator, and a provider of great places for children to have fun, to exercise, and to love the outdoors. The department is uniquely positioned to be such a catalyst. Our agencies manage 501 million acres of the nation's special places, one in every five acres in the nation. 
The Bureau of Land Management manages 3,500 recreation sites under its multiple use mission. The National Park Service cares for 391 units of the Park Service, some of which include our nation's most unique natural and cultural historical places. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services manages 547 refuges, including 2,500 miles of land and water trails, with an emphasis on six activities consistent with its mission of protecting wildlife and its habitat, hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, natural photography, environmental education, and interpretation. Each agency has a distinct mission. Together, the agencies offer children an endless array of recreational and educational opportunities in a myriad of natural settings. We have two formidable tools at our disposal, a land base and a, passion, uh, a set of passion professionals with interest and expertise in the natural world. The part department participates in thousands of programs that encourage kids to reconnect with nature, from interagency nationwide year-round programs that can impact large numbers of children, to special local events that target a limited population of youth. Some programs focus on introducing children to an outdoor experience, while other programs seek to provide a more immersive educational experience for our children. Our agencies are creative, making ways, making the ways that we can engage children and appeal to different interests and backgrounds of children limitless. An example of some of the programs that we either participate in or sponsor ourselves is Hands on the Lands program, the wonderful Outdoor World Program, referred to as WOW, the Youth Conservation Corps, Student Conservation Association, President Bush's Healthy U.S. Initiative. Take it to the outside, a BLM program to connect with your public lands, Junior Explorers Program, Student Education Employment Program, an Urban Tree House Program, Kids Fishing Day, the Great Background Bird Count, Catch a Special Thrill of Fishing uh, program set up by BOR, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. A Little Marine Explorers program. Uh, we have a host of them within the Department of Interior that we have sponsored for years and had millions of children go through our programs. Um, in conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, together we can help families and children become healthier and live fuller lives by reigniting America's passion for the outdoors. We can offer children opportunities by providing parks, trails, camping sites, and nature programs for children. We can work together to conserve and restore our land and make it accessible to urban and underserved children and others who would not normally venture outdoors. We can raise the next generation of conservationists, inspire the children of today to grow up to be the land stewards of tomorrow, and to ensure that they will care about and care for our nation's special places. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer questions when we get there. Thank you, sir. And uh, let me now turn to Chief uh, Gail Kimball of the Forest Service Department of Agriculture. Chief. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for the opportunity today to provide the department's views on how we are reconnecting kids with the outdoors. I am Gail Kimball, Chief of the United States Forest Service. We understand the significance and benefit of connecting our citizens and youth to the natural environment. We are stewards of over 193 million acres of national forest system lands. For over 100 years, we have been providing interpretive services, ranger talks, challenging summer outdoor work opportunities, and educational programs for youths and adults. From the time that, the, from the, time that rangers were first assigned to protect and conserve the forest reserves. Today, we have a world-class research organization devoting resources to examining the connections between our natural environment and the people that use our forests and grasslands, a technical assistance program that assists urban and rural communities in connecting with nature, and a myriad of programs and projects developed by Forest Service personnel to engage children in the outdoors. The national forests and grasslands are the natural backyards for many communities throughout the 46 states that have national forest system lands. These lands and our infrastructure of trails, roads, and recreation facilities provide opportunities for solace and solitude, challenge and risk, hunting and fishing, 
outlets for keeping physically fit and represent an important conduit for society's connection to nature. Yet even with the resources we devote to this part of our mission, environmental illiteracy is one of the most significant challenges facing America's wildlands. As our country becomes increasingly urban, most of America's children grow up with little connection to the natural world. Recent media attention has highlighted downward trends in visitation to national parks. Visitation numbers are more difficult for national forests and grasslands given the ready access to such lands. Still, our data shows a reduction in use by youth. We must examine approaches to connect children with the out of doors if we want that generation to care about clean water, clean air, wild places, and where forest products come from. The Forest Service has many strong programs across the agency to address this phenomenon, including programs such as Nature Watch, Project Learning Tree, A Forest for Every Classroom, Natural Inquirer, and Chicago Wilderness, which have accomplished a great deal. Building off this solid foundation, programs such as the new More Kids in the Woods initiative, connecting schools to the Forest Service and the Woodsy Owl Head Start program, will help to foster the next generation of conservation leaders and more active outdoor participants. We are reinvigorating our conservation education programs to focus on pre-K through 12th grade and their educators. Every year, tens of thousands of desk-bound students become connected to nature through Forest Service science. The Natural Inquirer, a middle school science journal written directly from published Forest Service research, taps into and stimulates students' natural curiosity about nature. We have copies available for each of you. One area of increasing focus for us is to address the need to engage urban and minority youth in nature-based activities. The Forest Service has broad authorities that allow our programs to work across the landscape, including inner city neighborhoods all the way to rural, remote communities. We work with community volunteers, state forestry agencies, other federal agencies, tribes, not-for-profit organizations, and other associations to plant trees and turn abandoned lots and brownfields into neighborhood parks that are a magnet for kids. Surveys conducted by the Centers for Disease Control document the rapid increase in childhood obesity. Being overweight or obese increases the risk of many diseases and health conditions, including the early onset of chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Physical inactivity is a contributing factor to this issue. The national forests and grasslands offer a wide array, a wide array of outdoor settings and opportunities for healthy physical activities. We provide important opportunities for meeting the needs for outdoor experiences, which can lead to healthier lifestyles. We are developing an increasing emphasis on programs that engage children in outdoor recreation activities to combat inactivity and sedentary lifestyles. Forest Service supported research is examining connections between people and nature and links being identified that could bring important and beneficial changes to communities and individuals. In summary, the Forest Service provides a diverse spectrum of programs, projects, research, and a spectacular land base to help meet the concerns raised by a number of committees on reconnecting children to nature. I am proud of the efforts of Forest Service employees and partners. We have more work to do to address these issues, and we will continue to support these efforts within the resources we have. I believe our work with children is critical to the long-term health of the lands under our stewardship and to, and to the Forest Service. This concludes my testimony. I'll be happy to answer any questions that committee members may have. Thank you very much, Chief. Let me uh, turn now to the Commissioner Gina McCarthy from Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for inviting me here today to offer my testimony. Um, I know you've heard and you will hear from many experts who will speak eloquently, and many have written eloquently, about the need and the importance of connecting children with nature. Today, we will, you will hear from many of us who have actually taken action to do just that. In particular, I'd like to call your attention to Richard Louv, the offer of Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, and many others who have observed that today's children are actually in danger of losing that connection, or indeed never getting the connection to nature that is so important. And it is clear that if we fail to get our children back outside and fail to have them make a connection with nature, our society, as well as our children, will suffer. Now, speaking to you as a mother of three, 
as well as an environmental professional, I'm gravely concerned with this issue, and I'm very engaged in this issue. Because if you show me a generation of adults that didn't experience the wonders of nature firsthand when they were young, I will show you taxpayers and voters who don't care about preserving open space, who don't understand about biodiversity, who won't invest in clean air and clean water, and will not work to maintain our forests and parks and keep our lands free from pollution. At least they won't care until it's too late. There is, of course, no way for us to turn back the times to the good old days when we as kids would fly out the door and not come home until the lights came on, uh, playing endlessly in unstructured play. Uh, but if we want to get our children out today, we can still do that. We just need to be creative. We need to be committed. We need to make it easy, safe. We need parents and their children outside in safe places, and we need to make it interactive for them. We can't just have open spaces and expect them to come. Now, in Connecticut, we've taken some steps, and we're trying to do an initiative that we had launched uh, with the help of Governor M. Jody Rell back last March, in March of 06, and we called it the No Child Left Inside Initiative. The goals of No Child are to reconnect our youngsters with the outdoors, to build the next generation of environmental stewards, and to showcase our state's wonderful parks and forests. And it's a multifaceted approach to spread the word to families of all types in all corners of the state. The key element of this initiative is our own brand of a reality TV show, and it's complete with clues and prizes. We call the multi-week contest a great park pursuit and we have families traveling to different state parks and forests across the state pursuing games and adventures. And when we launched it last year, the response was so overwhelming that we had to shut off uh, or overwhelm our state parks. We shut off the contest, but we launched it again this year in 2007, and we had more than 750 families signed up. That's more than 3,000 people signed up in the course of a couple of weeks and registered online to participate in this game. And I would encourage you to connect in with our website. It's called www.nochildleftinside.org because it's become a community bulletin board. There are pictures. There's, there's uh, comments from all the families participating. And you'll see what it looks like when families are having a wonderful time outdoors together. The seven-week adventure this year started in Bridgeport, which is an old industrial city like many that are scattered throughout New England. But we use the occasion to show people that there are great places to visit in this safe outdoor activities for them, no matter where they live. We had them fishing. Uh, in an urban pond and having fun in all the grasslands and the zoos that surround it. This past week, the families went on a hike up at Haystack Mountain State Park where they could see the beautiful views of Long Island Sound as well as the beautiful views of the Berkshires in Massachusetts. During the next five weeks, they'll be visiting five other parks, doing a variety of games, and they'll be eligible for grand prizes that were donated by private sector business retailers that are outdoor equipment like camping, hiking, bike, bicycling, to keep them engaged in outdoor activities. Now, while the Great Park Pursuit is the major focus of our No Child Left Inside at, uh, effort, it's not the only thing we're doing. We're, we're re-engaging park interpreters. We can't expect an urban kid to go in the middle of the woods, plunk them down, and say, go have a good time. We need to have staff there to, that will greet them, that can introduce them to the natural resources, that can really get our kids and families hooked. We're placing free park passes in our state parks, so that if in our libraries, um, I apologize, so that if access or funding is an issue, we'll get around that too. We're offering free park passes to every foster family because of donations from Bank of America. And we're reaching families that we never would have reached and drawn into our park system before. We have a new urban fishery fisheries program to bring the community in the urban areas fish that they can fish. We give them the poles. We give them the training. We connect with the park agency. We get them out there and get them hooked. We're focusing on safe swimming so that when we get them out there, they'll be safe while they're there. So we believe that Connecticut is paving the way and demonstrating that we can take action and we can turn all of this worry into great things that are exciting and that are fun and engaging. And today is a great opportunity for us to engage in this with Congress. Because we all know that it's very difficult to keep 
all of these programs operating and functioning. And as we're facing difficulties with budgets, it tends to be that parks and educational opportunities tend to end up being the last on the totem pole. But as you know, that's a bit short-sighted because nothing's more important than investing in the health and well-being of our children. Nothing's more important than stimulating this next generation of environmental stewards and reconnecting them to the outdoors. So through programs like No Child Left Inside, we really can make a difference. And I just end by, by mentioning Rachel Carson, because I know, Mr. Chairman, you did mention her. I don't know if you realize it, but this Sunday is Rachel Carson's 100th birthday. Uh, that we are celebrating. And as you know, she was one of the great environmental thinkers of our time. And everybody knows about her book, Silent Spring, which was a wonderful dedication to make us really sit up and take notice. And she pretty much single-handedly called attention to our great national treasure, the bald eagle, and helped to save that with that book. But Rachel Carson also wrote another book. And that book was called The Sense of Wonder. And it was about this connection, this special connection between children and nature. And what she said is if a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him the joy, the excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. That is exactly what we are trying to do in Connecticut through our No Child Left Inside initiative. We're trying to have children and adults share memorable adventures in our state parks so they can rediscover the joy, the excitement, and the mystery of our natural world. We hope with, with the support of the subcommittees here today that we can begin a similar national program that will reach every child in this country and give families everywhere an opportunity to have that kind of life-altering experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let me, uh, let me begin with uh, questions and, uh, and the other members of the committee as well. Uh, Chief uh, Kimball, you, you, you mentioned the environmental literacy uh, and, and in your testimony uh, and also and what a need that was, that a looming problem that that is becoming more and more. And the other issue that you mentioned was uh, the need to have an urban interface with our public places and our natural places. And, uh, and as you listen, as we listened to Ms. Uh, Commissioner McCarthy's uh, testimony, uh, she testified that even offering free park passes for targeted populations that are, that are underrepresented or underutilized our public parks is a way to increase uh, attendance at these state parks and get particularly young people and kids involved. Uh, as is there any concern on your part, Chief, as we continue to talk about increasing recreational fees, the kind of potentially negative impact it's, uh, it's going to have on efforts to encourage families and young people uh, to to use our natural our national forest land and uh, as you mentioned the visitation of young people to our uh, for public forest do you think that uh, that recreational fee has an impact on visitation rates uh, Chairman, less than 1% of the 193 million acres of National Forest System land is managed with a fee structure. Less than 1%. Okay. The, one the, the remaining acres, nearly 191 million acres, are, are, have, have open access to anyone and, and everyone. The National Forests vary pretty significantly from the National Parks in that we don't have entrance gates, we don't have access gates, and there's a tremendous uh, uh, landscape there available for use by all Americans and American visitors. Uh, the, the, we look at the National Forest as being a component in a system of public lands, including all the lands that Mr. Kaysen talked about, and uh, certainly Americans have access across that spectrum. One last, uh, one other question, Chief. Uh, in in the uh, fiscal year 2008 budget proposal from the administration, uh, it constricts the Forest Service budget to some of the estimates that we've heard is that if we were to be enacted as recommended, uh, that we're looking at 3,000, a cut of 3,000 FTEs. Uh, this potential, what effect would that have on, on the efforts that we're talking about today to re reconnect kids and, uh, and nature in our forests? 
The 2008 budget, as proposed by the administration, has a lot of very difficult trade-offs displayed in it, and certainly to finance fire suppression, it's caused us to have to uh, show reductions in other programs across the board. Uh, still, with the dollars that are proposed in that 2008 budget, we would look at prioritizing, allocating those monies to where there are there are contributed dollars and really focusing on where there's a, a larger gain to be uh, realized than just if there were National Forest System dollars applied to specific projects. And that larger gain, it, I would assume, is, is part of the subject of this uh, hearing today, reconnecting kids and, and young people to to our public lands. Absolutely. In fact, on Tuesday we had a, a ceremony at the Department of Agriculture where we awarded grants to 24 projects across the nation that where there were partners who had come forward with, with dollars and contributed time. And it's, it's, th this is not simply a Forest Service issue, but certainly we're all in this together across the federal agencies, the states, and local agencies. If, uh, Commissioner, if I may, other than, than the obvious point, which is funding, uh, can't get away from it, but other than, than the funding question, uh, which you, uh, you mentioned is in short supply uh, everywhere, uh, are there other specific ways that you think the federal government can partner with states to further the programs that Connecticut has, uh, has created a model nationally for, for all of us? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we've had a wonderful response both among with other states who are, are launching similar types of initiatives uh, as well as with the federal agencies who have shown great interest in looking at what they do and trying to figure out if, if they can uh, sort of restructure the way in which they think about the preservation of the state's forests and, natu and the country's forests and natural resources. Um, I know that I have met with many individuals at the, at the federal level. Uh, with the Forest Service, we've gone to working groups together. One of the things they are considering is that much of what we do on the conservation side um, has tended to set up areas that are less than inviting to individuals. Um, they almost look like they're pristine areas where you'd be afraid to bring your kids in for fear that they'd trample on the wrong flower. Um, I think we have to recognize that we need to draw kids in to these natural areas where they can have fun again uh, and, and try to engage them in an interactive way rather than create museums of our open spaces. And we have to think differently about it and there will be trade-offs associated with that. But if we continue to keep looking at these areas as if they are pristine and unconnected with individuals and with our kids, we will not reconnect kids as part of an ecosystem and get them to understand they are part of this larger natural world and it will reinforce this screen saver mentality that they are all themselves and then the world is this out there. Uh, we need to break through that Thank and you. I think part of that may be how we manage our lands. Thank you. And I just uh, before I turn over to the ranking member for his questions, just let me uh, note that Connecticut is, uh, has done a very impressive job connecting kids, young people with nature and with our public lands and uh, truly is a good model for all Thank of us to look much. at. Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Let me see if I can hustle through some of these questions for all of you. Um, Secretary Case and, and Chief Kimball, actually it's probably, not, it's probably unfair to ask you this, but maybe you get some kind could uh, provide for us, Chief Kimball, especially with the programs you're talking about, if there is any objective data you have showing the efficacy of those particular programs not anecdotal, and it's probably unfair right now, but if you have that, if you could supply that for us in the future, I'd be appreciative. Um, absolutely, we can supply that, given uh, uh, specific research data actually from a project in the Los Angeles Basin. We can provide that, just that kind of information. That would be helpful. And the same thing with Secretary Case. And, uh, I understand that uh, visitation in national parks, for example, is declining, but it's declining especially amongst young people. And I think Commissioner McCarthy just said, uh, I think, the key element to it, that oftentimes we need to come up with programs that make them more inviting, especially to young people coming in here. And uh, I was actually going to ask you some questions, but to be honest, the new director you have of the Park Service clearly understands that and has stated that's one of her goals, is to try and make these parks more inviting so, that, so it's not a museum and kids will be willing to come in there. So I commend the administration for what you're doing in both of these particular areas. Let me ask, spend most of the time, if I could, with the Commissioner 
and I and, and don't ask any of these questions in criticism because I, I enjoyed what you said and I'm very pleased with what's going on. I think it would be wise also, just for the record, to show that according to the Center of Disease Control, uh, there are four states, the four states that have the least obesity amongst their kids. Connecticut is one of those four states. And of those four states, only one, Colorado, is a public land state. The others have, have almost very little federal, federal public land states that are in there. I did notice, that we'll have testimony later on, that in a 15-year period of time, organized sports have increased like 27 percent, but the obesity has still increased beside that. How long has the Connecticut program been going on? Well, that's the first question. How long have you been doing this, this program? We launched it in March of 06. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually wondering, have you done any kind of studies to see if there is a Hawthorne effect going on, uh, i.e., people get excited about something when it's new and then it drag, drops off precipitously? I'm making the assumption you probably haven't been going long enough with that program to make that kind of evaluation. No, I, I, I can't say. I, I mean, we can give you some anecdotal evidence. Certainly people are excited about it. Whether it's going to last is the challenge. In, in moving this into something other than this yeah. game situation is what we need to do. Which is a challenge, obviously, the parks and the forest have at the same time. It's, it runs with everything, any kind of organized program. Can I just ask you, though, some specifics you had there? When you said they went to uh, fun in the grasslands and the zoos, games in the park, can you just give me an example of what you're talking about? Sure. Let me, let me tell you what we did. Um, we, we have launched this a, a couple of times, and, and we bring in programs that are already developed, educational initiatives that have been funded through federal dollars and state dollars, like Project Learning Tree, uh, WOW, what? Project Wild. I mean, there are, these are all educational I'm, programs. I'm not trying to cut you off. I just want to know, what would the kids actually be doing? Uh, that, that's, it, part of it was visiting booths where we have a variety of activities. They were fishing. We actually taught them how to fish. We gave away fishing poles that were donated to us. We had instructors there teaching kids and parents how to fish. We even did silly things like tug-of-war, three-legged races, sack races. That's the kind of stuff I want. Because it lights up families. This isn't just connecting kids with the outside world. It was a wonderful memory-building moment. It was really priceless right. to see this happen. It was totally unstructured play, All right. which is what we don't get. That's, that's what I want here, and I appreciate that. I, especially we noticed also with the chief when you said the kids got hooked on the fishing. I'm supposing you're talking about the kids, not necessarily the fish. <laughs> nice pun, anyway. Much more the kids than the fish, actually. I've got like one minute. Let me pontificate for just a minute. I appreciate the uh, testimony of the commissioner because you have illustrated what a state can actually do uh, with the creativity of a state. Louis Brandeis said the states are the great laboratory of experimentation in America. What you were doing in Connecticut probably won't work in Alaska. I don't think it would work in, in, in Utah either. And I think what you illustrate is the importance that states can play in this role by designing programs specifically for their demographic needs. And that's why the states need to have the greatest amount of flexibility. The worst thing I think that could happen to this is in some way letting the federal government federalize this program and try to export it through, throughout the rest of the nation. And, and it's, it's my, old, my old background as a school teacher and a member of the legislature, I realized it was often easy to come to the legislature and try and mandate a program for the schools to carry through simply because you only have one spot to, one spot to stop and you can mandate it over everybody. But even if we mandated something on a state, if the local school board didn't buy into that program, it wasn't going to be done. And I think you have illustrated very clearly uh, the same thing that will happen on the federal level. We could mandate almost anything we want to. If a state hasn't bought into it, if the local communities haven't bought into it, if they're not willing to put forth their money and to work seriously and have this as a major concern, we can mandate anything we want to appear and it just flat out won't happen. So I commend what you've done in the state of Connecticut. And I think it's a good model for other states to look at and then try to replicate it by their own needs and their own standard and their own basis and with their own commitment. And I'm sorry I went over. I apologize for that. Let me uh, ask uh, our colleague, uh, Ms. Uh, Hersit Sandlin, if she has any questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony today. Um, I agree to a large measure with what the ranking member was talking about in terms of the flexibility 
uh, that, that states maintain as it relates to developing these programs. However, some states are better than others in working directly with tribes to develop programs that reach children in Indian country. And so I would ask you, Mr. Kaysen and Chief um, Kimball, what uh, has been developed through your agencies, specifically with tribes, uh, to enhance these outdoor experiences for Native American children when we have the highest teen suicide rates among that demographic in the country, when we have not so much um, in terms of the exact uh, figures that I have for childhood diabetes, but clearly adult onset diabetes in Indian country. Um, so what, what's been the outreach there? Are there any programs that have been specifically designed through either of your agencies to work with tribes to enhance outdoor experiences with the Forest Service uh, or other outdoor programs through the BIA or elsewhere with tribes directly? Um, it, with the Forest Service, we actually have uh, over 600 offices located across the country, most often in very rural communities, and most often the closest federal or state agency office to so many tribal headquarters locations. Uh, the Forest Service has been very actively involved in working with tribes. An immediate example I can give you is in Tuesday's a ceremony that was hosted by a number of partner groups. We were actually able to make an award to a program that's been ongoing for a number of years with the Salish Kootenai Tribe in Montana, where the Rocky Mountain Research Station is working with kids at the sixth grade level to get kids out involved with understanding the ecosystem and ecology around Flathead Lake, which is an important tribal area. On the Nez Perce Reservation with the Nez Perce Tribe, the Clearwater National Forest in Idaho works very closely with the leadership on the Nez Perce Tribe to offer different programs to the kids in, in that location. This is repeated around the country working with, with tribes, with pueblos, with, with a lot of different Native American groups, both at the governmental level and at the cultural level. And just a quick follow-up, uh, Chief Kimball, are the state governments in Montana and Idaho involved as partners in that program as well? Not in those two that I mentioned, but the states are very involved in a number of other programs. We try and not duplicate, but rather try and um, ensure that a pretty broad application of our resources. Uh, Congressman, I, I would say for the Department of Interior, as you know, we have the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the Department of Interior, and we have government-to-government -government relationships with 561 tribes uh, scattered across the U.S. Uh, one of the things that I would point out is that generally Indian country is rural to begin with. Uh, the, the way that our country expanded and where we placed Indians ended up having them in rural locations. So the, the typical uh, environmental exposure for Indian children is rural to begin with. Then if you take a look at the Department of Interior overall, most of our lands, our fish and wildlife refuges, our national parks, our Bureau of Land Management land, and the other programs we have are principally rural as well. And we have cooperative and partnering relationships with both state governments, local governments, Indian tribes, um, private sector organizations on how we can bring children into our environment, uh, which is essentially a rural environment. So across the board, either through 638 compacting or contracting under the Indian Self-Determination Act, there may be uh, examples there where we've actually contracted with Indian governments to undertake some of our programs. Uh, as Gail was mentioning, we have that kind of a program at the National Bison Range in Montana with the Salish and Kootenai and with the Askabathan tribe in Alaska. Um, so we have a, a multitude of opportunities there. Uh, I don't know the full raft of uh, programs where we've actually contracted with the Indians, but those are a couple examples. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman. And if I might add just real quickly, too, that we have a lot of natural resource camps for Native American youth, the Forest Service does, and in partnership with states and local agencies and certainly with the tribes. In, in some of those camps, they even go on further to provide training for different potential jobs uh, in firefighting. And um, these are very active programs, and we'd be happy to visit with you more. And I'm, a, I'm well aware of the partnership in South Dakota with the Forest Service, with the state firefighting team out in western South Dakota. And uh, 
uh, with the students that I have met personally from some of the tribes, not just in South Dakota, but surrounding states that have participated in, and understand how important that is. But Mr. Chairman, if I may uh, just ask for one more minute to comment on Mr. Kaysen's uh, response. I think what we're trying to get at here is an educational outdoor experience for children. It's not a rural experience. It's an educational outdoor experience. I grew up on a farm in a rural county right on a national wildlife refuge and benefited from programs offered within the refuge, benefited from the types of field trips that some of the schools in this rural county participated in. So I don't think that it's um, adequate simply to say that given the history of where reservations were located there, the children are growing up in a rural setting. It's creating programs where we integrate native culture that has been demonstrated to enhance the educational experience to participate in not only with what the Forest Service has to offer or other federal lands, but also uh, providing resources and expertise um, with the sensitivity and input gathered from elders and others to create these programs, not just the fact that because these young people are growing up in a very remote area that that in and of itself um, addresses the issue that urban young people may not have. So I appreciate some of those relationships that have developed where as it relates to park management and other things, but I do want to make clear that just because a young person grows up in rural America doesn't mean they're having an enhanced outdoor educational experience unless we have the programs uh, that we've developed to ensure that. So I appreciate uh, the additional time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gilchrist, any questions, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I guess the word here is initiative on our part. It's not, the word is not a mandate. The word is not a federal program. I think the word is initiative and what the general lady from South Dakota said, I always get those, North Dakota, South Dakota, I always get those two states mixed up, but South Dakota, is the word integration. It's, it's the integration of ideas, uh, not necessarily that it's coming from the federal government or the state government or the local government. It's, it's the integration of ideas. And Emerson, Emerson gave a quote, said a quote a number of years ago, uh, which I'll paraphrase, um, a thousand forests from one acorn. And it's that seed that we plant and I remember back in the 60s when President Kennedy and his family were playing touch football, hiking mountains, and going on 50-mile hikes, and I was in high school at the time, and we, we wanted to do all of them. It was just the idea that, um, that people were doing that. Um, so I, I think that, um, and recently, a few years ago, I started in my district taking homeless children on picnics and hikes and canoes, canoe rides, hikes through the woods. And many of these homeless children, my area is mostly rural, but there's a few urban areas, and I can tell you whether they're rural kids or urban kids, some of them have no exposure to the outside, to the woods. So what we did was, and we also take juvenile delinquents, kids from an urban area, uh, kids from homeless shelters along with their families, and the way we set it up, we brought them to this beautiful spot on a tidal basin. We laid out on two big picnic tables every little nut and grape and seed and um, you name it that we could find. We put it on a table. We said we're going to go for a hike like the Indians did a thousand years ago. And here's a bag and this is what we want you to pick up and this is what you're going to have for lunch. And you would have thought that each one of those little um, berries or acorns or beech nuts or cattails or whatever they gathered was worth a hundred dollars. They were so excited. Now, it did take a little organization to do it, but for the most part, they were on their own during that day with a, with a little bit of direction. Um, and that seed that was planted into their minds uh, that we do several times a year um, was exceeded all our expectations about their wonderment and, and a child's ability to learn. So what I, I would suggest, um, going back to what my high school days were like with sneaking out of the house at 4 a.m. in the morning with my high school buddies because my parents didn't want us to walk around Rawway, New Jersey, where I grew up, uh, for 50 miles. But we did it. We mapped out 50 miles. Pretty sore when we got back. And we played touch football all the time. Um, could local rangers, whether it's BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, Wildlife Refugees, or even people in the state, 
invite their member of Congress to invite a group of children and their parents for a hike through the woods or some activity like that. Across the country, you'd have 535 people doing some activity, not a mandate, but taking some initiative, creating that ingenuity on the part of your partners in your district uh, to set up a program with a local homeless shelter with, uh, with urban kids, with Native Americans, with the Lions Club, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, or whatever, uh, that could be carried on for um, a long time to come. Uh, the gentlelady from Connecticut mentioned Last Child in the Woods, which is uh, an extraordinary book that I guess if you thought about it, you would probably already have all the answers, but just reading the book re-enhances um, a view that uh, is deep inside all of us. So uh, what I would like to suggest, and, and your quick comment on it for my last 15 seconds, is could a park ranger, wildlife refuge manager, BLM, forest service manager, um, invite the send out an invitation to the local congressman to talk about an idea where you could get kids out in the woods with their parents? Make sure your answer is no. Come on. Hey, I was a school teacher. I was an old school teacher. Actually, we all compete pretty uh, fiercely for the time of the members when they're home during August recess, but we could certainly work on that. Uh, I agree with that. We do compete for the attention that we can get. We often host groups and congressmen, any congressman here, we'd be happy to have you out on the public lands. Thank you, Mr. You're, Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Schuler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, would like to reiterate uh, uh, what my colleague, Mr. Uh, Gilchrist, is saying. Um, far too often, um, you know, I grew up in Western North Carolina, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, I'm Eighty-three percent of my home county was the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So we really took it for granted that uh, that all kids stayed outside all the time. And now having kids of my own. Uh, I'm very pleased that, that my wife had those same values and our kids stay outside all the time. I mean, we don't, my dad never let us have any of the, uh, uh, the game machines on our TV. Uh, you know, it wasn't just, that wasn't part of our lifestyle, but far too often today we're seeing because both parents are having to work. Uh, a lot of times they're either with babysitters or with their grandparents in my district and um, not as often outside. Um, so I, and the first time I had the opportunity to actually meet with a, with a wildlife officer was actually he was checking my license and seeing if I was fishing with live bait on the, on the park. So I think we we're going to have to, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Carson, uh, what are some relationships that we have? I mean, we, we talked about, you know, what are some relationships that you're working with uh, the Department of Education, the secretary there, of how we can actually integrate um, the education of the outdoors? Um, we're not, we talk about how we can be actively involved in the schools, and we're trying to get our kids involved. It seems like that's the best place to do it is to actually get our kids involved. Are we getting officers? Are we getting the management uh, into the schools to have these type of programs? It's a learning experience. And then, okay, here's what you can do uh, on our on our public lands. Now let's let's take it outside the classroom and let's really be instrumental. I know when we were uh, my kids were up here for a short time uh, during uh, January, February, and March. They're young kids, so they're not they're in school but preschool and. One of the great things, there's a program here in uh, Alexandria that uh, uh, the kids are, they have a program and the kids are outside like 70% of the time. 30% is inside, 70% is outside. It's learning, it's, it's, it's finding the acorns, it's, it's uh, looking at the seeds and, and, and where the grasses are growing and, and, and frogs and, and lizards. Um, what are we doing from a standpoint with the education program? That's our basis, that's our children. Um, Uh, uh, great questions, multi-part question. Um, I, I guess a couple comments. Uh, first, I grew up just like you did. Um, I started hunting and fishing when I was a young kid. Uh, did that with my dad for a long time. Uh, so I grew up in the woods, being doing things in the woods. Uh, I had all the traditional 
pets, uh, turtles, snakes, frogs, you know, <laughs> praying mantis, all that stuff. Uh, and my boys do too. I have two young boys right now who are 10 and 12. And uh, we've gone through the same thing. I have pet homes in my garage for snakes and turtles and frogs. Um, and you mentioned the, the Game Boys. Uh, both of their Game Boys are currently embargoed now because they've spent too much time on it and not enough time outside. Uh, you asked the question about working with the Department of Education. Uh, I would say that um, as far as I know, we haven't had a specific conversation with Margaret Spellings about um, trying to do things from top down. Typically what we end up doing is working from the bottom up. And we do have a multitude of programs and contacts between our professional staff, the 70,000 employees we have in the Department of Interior with school systems across the country. And that we work actively with schools on a school by school basis to get kids to the outdoors, whether it be in fish and wildlife refuges or it's in parks or it's in our BLM lands. Because um, as I said, we have 500 million acres of land out there in various states. And so we work with schools to get kids out. Um, as it turns out, uh, Congressman, we're planning to have Margaret Spellings over the department to talk about Indian education in the near future. So I'll put it on the Secretary's radar screen to actually ask the question, is there something we can do together as we talk to her about Indian education? Uh, we'll see if there's something we can do in a top-down format on this, this uh, element. Real quickly, um, uh, Commissioner McCarthy, thank you for, uh, t tell us a little bit more about the relationship with Bank of America and how that's actually um, obviously been a positive uh, influence on being able to make some of this from a financial standpoint. It was a wonderful thing. We, uh, in Connecticut, when we launched our initiative, it got a considerable amount of press because it was very positive, obviously. And while Connecticut doesn't have a huge amount of, of open space land, we certainly have a lot of parks and forests that the state owns uh, and we maintain. So there was a lot of interest among the states, and we simply got a blind call from Bank of America who said, I love this initiative. They obviously have money that they spend on charitable giving. Uh, they, they said, we have $10,000, how can you use it? Um, and we said, well, I'll take it and figure it out. Uh, but we had a conversation with them, and we knew that, that there, were, uh, there, there were more than uh, 2,500 or so foster families uh, in the state. And we well know that those are not the families that generally go to our state parks. So we ended up that the, they donated funding to an advocacy organization uh, for Connecticut foster families. And they, in turn, we sent a letter out and offered a free pass to any foster family that wanted one. And 1,700 responded. So we were able to send them out uh, free of charge. So it's been a wonderful thing. They offered it again this year. They've offered it to two other states in our region who have launched similar initiatives, uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So there are wonderful private partnerships av available for this activity because it is something that seems to be near and dear to everyone's heart. Well, thank you for your testimony. And uh, Chief Campbell, thank you for uh, testifying again. Thank all of you for uh, being here today. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes, questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can we get over here? Um, I appreciate your having this hearing today. I've, I've started to read more about uh, this issue that some call nature deficit disorder, other terms where kids are just not outside enough. And as a result, I've been paying a lot more attention to how my own three kids spend their days. Um, and it is, it is obvious the, the pull, the forces that pull kids inside and keep them inside are, are significant. And any, any bag of tricks we can come up with to try to pull kids outside and have them engage. Obviously, the dividends are, are both at the individual level because um, children benefit when they're outdoors in so many ways. But collectively, we all benefit because it raises their consciousness. And they are going to be the next generation stewards of our environment and the outdoors. And so, uh, so there's a real value there um, as well. I'm very interested in the potential to, um, to have there be more integration uh, within schools of that consciousness of environmental science, education, and, um, 
I'm, I'm, I serve on the uh, Education Labor Committee. I'm trying to bring that perspective uh, to the table as we look at the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind and where there's potential to, to integrate that more. Um, I agree that it has to be done not through a mandating kind of approach, but by creating initiatives and uh, grant opportunities and other ways to encourage uh, schools to work collaboratively with all the resources that are out there to deliver these these programs to children. Um, so in that vein, uh, 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 Commissioner McCarthy, I, I would love to have you speak just a little bit more uh, uh, to what Congressman Schuler began a conversation on, and that, that is um, where do you see the most effective partnerships existing? In your experience, uh, can you describe some of the most effective partnerships that have ex existed between schools and, um, and parks and, and other resources that are out there? And uh, maybe you could comment on, on what you've seen at the elementary, middle, and high school level um, in particular. Um, we, we have been doing work that's been supported by the federal government and state funds for a number of years in terms of trying to get environmental education into the schools and make some connections. And it's everything from planting trees in gardens at the schools to after school activities. We even have a, uh, we have our own camp where kids can go and, and there's a number of programs from kids from very small to, to older. Um, but what I've found is uh, with No Child Left Behind, we have more difficulty with the no child left inside. Uh, we are losing our, our you know, recesses. They're not going outside uh, in Connecticut as they were before. And getting that opportunity to have even field trips out to the parks is getting limited. We have to, we have to be very careful to take and build it into curriculum that is in the, the standard curriculum for the schools now, so that if you're out on science, we have it, out in the park, we have to connect it with a science curriculum, or we may be able to connect it with one of our historic parks and build it into the, the social studies curriculum. But you, there is no free time in the schools. Uh, and so we have struggled to figure out what's the next big thing we can do, which is why we began to focus less on the schools and more on families because I think we're trying to build, build a, a way of doing exactly what you suggested, which was how do you make, draw kids out from their homes, in their computers, in their video games, in their iPods, and it needs to be interactive. You know, what we, have, what we have not adjusted well to, I think, is this need for an interactive way of getting kids outside into the parks and into the forests. You know, it's just not good enough to have it there and they will come. So part of the thing that I'm trying to drive at the federal level is that it's great to have a centennial where you invest in, in huge infrastructure in the parks, but just because you, you build a clean toilet, it doesn't mean they're going to come right. or go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Um, you know, you have to have something that draws them there, and, and we have not invested in the people and the programs to keep up with that investment, and you really need to drive that home. And for us, the Great Park Pursuit was about families. I'm trying to make families reconnect, have some wonderful unstructured play, and make that connection outside. And that seems to be working, at least anecdotally. I could show you the emails of families who started out going to a park, and in fact, the, the winner of last year's Park Pursuit, because we had donated large gifts, outdoor equipment, took the, the camping equipment rather than the more expensive kayaks because their family wanted to go camping. And they went camping last year three or four times. So they're making those connections. We just need to drive them out there initially. And that's the challenge. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I believe that uh, the, you made a reference to sort of the, the fact that there's not a time in the day for recess for physical education. It, um, it would probably be productive, and maybe this is happening for the advocates, those who are advocating for more uh, recess and more physical education to, be, to, to come back into schools to join up with the advocates of, of children being outside generally. Um, and I agree that, that family, the family opportunities are critical outside of school. Uh, but too often, it seems like families are um, having to battle against the wrong kind of modeling in the schools on this particular thing. And, and if, if one could hand off to the other and back in terms of this consciousness about the environment, it'd be much better for our kids and raise that awareness across the board. So hopefully we can, we can move in that direction. I'd love to work with you on a Congressman. That's a great idea. 
Excellent point, Mr. Sarbanes. That's a very, very good point. Uh, one quick question and then a comment, and then I want to thank first the panel for your, for your time and your testimony. One of the issues that comes up from parents and uh, even community-based organizations that want to want to work in a, in public parks and forests and and are working with kids is the issue of safety. And let me begin with you, Commissioner. Uh, and how how do we how do we deal with that concern or that worry? Legitimate, it might be or not be, but the fact that that perception and that question of safety comes up uh, needs to be dealt with. And, and, and please, and Chief, uh, Deputy Secretary, please comment as well. I think, that, I think that's probably the singest, single biggest issue that we are facing is the safety issue. I know when, when my kids were young, it was a large issue. Um, I was more relaxed than many of the other parents. I can remember my daughter, Julie, when she was nine, she wanted to go with me to the Blue Hills, which is a small little hiking area n downtown, uh, near the, just south of Boston. Beautiful area. I went there every day as a kid. My father took us all there. And she called up a friend to take her friend with us when we were going hiking, and, and she couldn't go. I spoke to the friend's mother, and she said, oh, I can't let her go there. there are I've heard there are snakes there. And I said, yeah, there are snakes there. That's why we're going. <laughs> you know, We've terrified our children, not just about what could happen to them if they're out of our eyesight, but what could happen to them if they actually experience real, real world things. And so that is really why we focused on our park and our forest system. It's a, it's a safe place. People recognize it so. We are, it's a controlled atmosphere. There are 105 state parks and 32 state forests in the small community like Connecticut. And they're wonderfully safe places. And all we really need to do is get them engaged initially with, the, with this seven or eight week game. They get more comfortable. They can understand what's risky and what isn't. And hopefully begin to integrate it into their own lives in a way that we don't need to support any longer. So that's the idea. Thank you, Chairman, and I believe I testified to you a couple months ago, and, and this was one of th those issues. Um, the, uh, the, the whole business with the kids being more comfortable in the out of doors is an important part of our conservation ed programs as well. Not being afraid of the snakes, but maybe looking for the snakes. Not being afraid of the bears, but knowing how to behave around bears. Not being afraid of alligators, but knowing how to behave around alligators. So it, that's an important part of our program. At the same time, we do realize that our national forests and grasslands are often in very remote locations and sometimes can attract people who perhaps uh, aren't the cream of society and, uh, and they create some, some uh, um, issues for forest visitors. And we're working very hard with that, with, uh, on that with other uh, law enforcement agencies and uh, both federal, state, and county, all federal, state, and county. Um, the only thing I would add, Chairman, is it's basically a risk management process and education process. We, we have all kinds of risk in life, and, and getting exposed to the outdoors, you take some minimal risk being in the outdoors, but if you're educated about what they are and how to deal with them, as, as Gail was saying, that you can mitigate a lot of those. And, and there's a flip side risk, too. That if we don't get our kids in the outdoors, there are risks and consequences that happen with that too. So we just need to be smart about it to the extent that we as federal agencies are sponsoring visits to our federal lands. We try to take a look at what the character of the land is, what kind of uh, recreational or outdoor opportunity we can offer. We look for the safety issues and try to mitigate those safety issues when we expose people to the outdoors. So there, there is an intelligent process that we go through to deal with the safety issues. Thank you very much. And once again, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. can I uh, just yes. follow up with a quick comment? Um, th there's always that safety issue, but I'm glad Ms. Kimball made a comment about how do you deal with it when you're out in the woods and knowledge is the solvent for danger, which is a quote by Norman Cousins some 40 years ago. It's that information that, that is so valuable, and you can't get it on a computer screen. But I wanted to follow up on a couple of things that Mr. Sarbanes said, talking about education. Uh, and then Ms. McCarthy made a comment about no child left behind, which is something I voted against, mainly for the reasons that you said, plus I was a former school teacher. And two quick comments. As a former school teacher, every year in September, um, we would, I, and I taught history 
we'd learn about Native Americans and early American history and things like that, and we would cure and tan cow hides in the room. Now, we had a little easier access to cow hides because we were surrounded by dairy farms. But we'd also send the kids out early in September to run through the fields and pick up grasshoppers, bring them back in the room, and we'd fry them because Native Americans would eat them when there weren't other things around. But the excitement that these kids generate and their, their ability to then learn about American history uh, was extraordinary. The other quick comment I wanted to make about Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. If the core curriculum in a school, if you, want them, you want kids to learn math and science and literature and history and poetry and art and all of those things to make them fundamentally a sound human being. The core curriculum could be the environment, could be the ecology. And this is, in essence, what uh, Richard Louv talks about in his book. And he actually gives, in several chapters, a method of employing um, ecology as the core curriculum. Because out of ecology comes an understanding of human activity, and is it compatible with nature's design? And that includes all of the sciences, all of, including math and everything else. So I think maybe there should be some initiative. Mr. Sarbanes could drop this as an amendment that if we want to reauthorize No Child Left Behind, the core curriculum for public schools to get federal aid, well, I don't want to go that far with all the mandates. We're, we don't want a mandate. But um, thanks again for all your testimony um, and your insight. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could just make a comment on this same point. Um, we, we just had a senior executive um, meeting for the Department of Interior where we brought all of our senior executives together, virtually all, and Richard was one of the speakers, a uh, huh. lunchtime speaker for us, and we actually passed out a copy of his book to all of our senior executives as a, a further step in trying to reinvigorate our thinking process and the looking for opportunities within the Department of Interior to connect kids with nature. So it's an initiative, it's timely that you were commenting on it. Thank you. Uh, before I close, Mr. Sarbanes, any closing comments? Uh, thank you again. And uh, I, I was, the, the comment I'm gonna make, and I think Mr. Gilchrist made a good point when he, uh, when he talked about, uh, let's not get hung up on the issue mandate, but really concentrate on the idea of initiatives that, that that we need to take and, uh, and the incentives that might accompany those initiatives as we go along. Uh, the, the other point I was gonna make, and that's uh, about the urban interface and the fact that youth have to be involved. Uh, back home in Tucson, uh, we're, we're blessed with many beautiful public places. And uh, second, third generation kids that, that live in the community uh, and they're that we do outings. Uh, second, third generation, never seen the Grand Canyon. Uh, don't know where Organ Pipe is. Uh, have not been to the forest or petrified forest. Have not been to the Saguaro National. Uh, on and on and on. And I think uh, that to me is probably the greatest motivator because once they do, uh, they become allied with the idea to conserve and preserve those places. And hopefully this hearing is gonna lead us in that direction to concentrate on initiatives and the kinds of incentives that need to accompany those initiatives. I wanna thank the panel very much and uh, we'll call the next panel now. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to add, when you're coming on that, Gail and I are just gonna put out this publication in the Sunday paper in Tucson in the next couple of weeks to invite all the people there out to our public lands just like you were talking about. Thank you.
Let me thank the, the panelists for uh, being here today. Very much appreciated. Looking forward to your testimony. As I indicated to the previous panel, your full, uh, your written testimony will be entered in its entirety in the record, and uh, ho and hopefully we can all try to maintain a five minute for the for the oral comments. And let me begin with. Uh, uh, Dr. Ginsburg, American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, for your testimony, doctor, and thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am moved by the testimony that I've already heard, as well as the congressional statements that I've heard, and it makes I'm truly honored to be here. My name is Dr. Ken Ginsburg, and I'm proud to represent the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is a nonprofit professional organization of 60,000 pediatricians. I'm an adolescent medicine specialist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. My major interest is resilience, the exploration of how individuals thrive despite adversity. And while Ms. Sandlin is not in the room, I want to say that my interest and my passion in resilience came from the inspiration that I felt during my formative years as a young adult when I spent several years on the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota. And my interest in resiliency stems from their spirit and what I learned from those people. I've also authored the Academy book, A Parent's Guide to Building Resilience in Children and Teens, Giving Your Child Roots and Wings. Simply stated, play is the work of childhood. Play is essential to healthy development because it contributes to the cognitive, physical, social, and emotional well-being of children and youth. In January, the Academy published a new clinical report affirming the central importance of play for all children and addressing the marked decline in playtime available to many children. That statement, of which I was the lead author, marked the first time that the American Academy of Pediatrics considered that children's playtime was sufficiently endangered to warrant an, officially, an official policy pronouncement in support of its importance. This hearing also recognizes that fact by highlighting the shrinking opportunities available for most children to engage in exploratory play outdoors. Play is so important to optimal child development that it has been recognized by the United Nations High Commissions for Human Rights as a fundamental right of every child. Play allows children to use their creativity while developing their imagination, dexterity, and physical, cognitive, and emotional strength. Play is crucial to healthy brain development. It is through play that children at a very early age engage and interact with the world around them. Play allows children to create and explore a world they can master, conquering their fears while practicing adult roles, sometimes together with other children or with their parents. As they master their world, play helps children develop new competencies that lead to enhanced confidence and the resilience they will need to face future challenges. Undirected play allows children to learn how to work in groups to share, to negotiate, to resolve conflicts, and to learn self-advocacy skills. When play is allowed to be child-driven, children practice decision-making skills, move at their own pace, discover their own areas of interest, and ultimately engage fully in the passions they wish to pursue. Child-driven play can have other benefits as well, most notably in promoting physical health. It has been suggested that encouraging unstructured play may be an exceptional way to increase physical activity levels in children, making an important strategy in the resolution of the obesity epidemic. Overweight and obesity increase children's risk for a range of health consequences, including heart disease, diabetes, bone and joint problems, and sleep apnea. Overweight children often become overweight adults, and the effect of obesity on adult health is well known and profound. Playing in an outdoor natural environment allows children to explore both their own world and their own minds. Nature places virtually no bounds on the imagination and it engages all of the senses. For all children, this setting allows for the full blossoming of creativity, curiosity, and the associated developmental advances. The outdoors also presents marvelous opportunities for parents to interact with their children in a fashion that fosters both the development of the relationship between the child and parent and the child. When parents observe their children in play or join with them in child-driven play, they are given a unique opportunity to see the world from their child's vantage point as the, world as the child navigates a world perfectly created to fit his or her needs. 
But we must emphasize that if we are successfully connect kids with nature to take the fear of nature away from them, we must first diminish the fear of nature in their parents and instill the love of nature in their parents. Play in nature provides children with opportunities for self-directed physical activity that can help promote physical health and reduce obesity. Unlike team sports, individual play in nature allows the child to tailor exercise to his or her own interests and abilities, often using the highest levels of creativity. The great outdoors can move children away from the passive entertainment of computers and TV and into an interactive form that engages both body and mind. The AAP makes a range of recommendations for our pediatricians so that when they interact with families to emphasize that they emphasize the importance of unstructured play for healthy child development. Many of these recommendations are equally well relevant for our governmental policies, and so I'd like to paraphrase them for you today. One, policymakers should recognize that free play is a healthy, essential part, uh, part of childhood. All children should be afforded ample, unscheduled, independent, non-screen time to be creative, to reflect, and to decompress. Two, governmental policy should emphasize that active child-centered play is a time-tested way of producing healthy, fit, young bodies. Three, federal agencies should support the development of safe spaces in under-resourced and impoverished neighborhoods. This may include initiatives such as opening school, library, or community facilities to be used by children and their parents after school or on weekends, or by establishing programs, that, and we've heard about them, that help connect families with federal parks and lands. Four, the federal government should support a variety of physical education opportunities for children in addition to school physical education programs. These must include the protection of children's recess time and the promotion of extracurricular physical activity programs and non-structured physical activity before, during, and after school. Federal policy should support the reduction of those environmental barriers to an active lifestyle, which means that the government should adequately fund programs that support families' efforts to engage in a healthy lifestyle. Federal efforts should build upon social marketing, social marketing that promotes increased physical activity. Programs and initiatives at federal agencies can help promote active, healthy living as a normative lifestyle. In conclusion, I genuinely appreciate this opportunity to present testimony on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The Academy applauds the subcommittee's efforts to bring attention to the issues associated with the health and developmental benefits of unstructured play in a natural environment. Federal policies can, can serve an important role in promoting opportunities for active, healthy living for all children including through creative use of federal lands programs. Let us never forget that children will lead us into the future. We must assure that our future leaders, the people who will be sitting at this table in 30 years, will love, appreciate, and care for the environment. We look forward to working with you to protect and promote the health and well-being of all children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Amy Perchuk, did I say it correctly? Perchuk. Thank you. Managing Editor, Children and Nature Network. Yes. Please. Um, on behalf of Richard Louvre and the Children and Nature Network, uh, I am going to be talking today about a challenge that will profoundly impact the relationship of humans with the environment and on how we can face that challenge successfully. I'll be reading from a uh, testimony prepared by Richard Louvre, and I'd be happy to answer questions following the testimony. We live in a country of bountiful natural resources, land, water, wildlife. Yet within the space of a few decades, the way children understand and experience their neighborhoods and the natural world has changed radically. Children are far more aware of the global threats to the environment, but their physical contact, their intimacy with nature is fading. As one suburban fifth grader put it in what has become the most quoted statement in the emerging children in nature movement, I like to play indoors better because that's where all the electrical outlets are. His desire is not that uncommon. In a typical week, only 6% of children ages 9 to 13 play outside on their own. And studies also show a dramatic decline in the past decade in such outdoor activities as swimming and fishing. Even bike riding is 31% down since 1995. 
Urban, suburban, and even rural parents cite a number of everyday reasons why their children spend less time in nature than they themselves did, including access to nature, competition from television, computers, and Game Boys, dangerous traffic, and more homework and other activities. But most of all, parents cite fear, fear of strangers. Conditioned by round-the-clock news coverages, they believe that there is an epidemic of abductions, despite the evidence that the number of the number has actually remained roughly the same for the past two decades, and the 2007 data shows that child safety is at an all-time high. Part of our task as a society is to begin to th think in terms of comparative risks and to consider the great benefits of a nature-child reunion. Yes, there are risks outside our homes, but there are also risks of raising children under virtual house arrest threats to their independent judgment and value of place, to their ability to feel awe and wonder, and to their sense of stewardship for the earth, and most immediately, threats to their psychological and physical health. We've witnessed the rapid increase of childhood obesity, type 2 diabetes. Healthcare leaders now worry that the current generation of children may be the first since World War II to die at an earlier age than their parents. Getting kids outdoors more, riding bikes, running, swimming, and especially experiencing nature directly may well serve as an antidote to much of what ails the youth. Congress has a unique opportunity in this and coming years to help turn these trends around. Government cannot do this alone, nor does it have to. A public movement is growing to leave no child inside. But government, with its influence over parks, open space, and how we use these resources, shape our cities, education, and health care systems, has a critical role to play. Rather than simply stemming the tide, our nation can realize enormous benefits for the physical, emotional, and cognitive health of our children and for the health of the Earth itself. What can government do? How can it expand the good work that has begun? We spell out a series of specific suggestions for programs and initiatives in the prepared testimony we submit to you today. And here are a few examples. Government could increase the number of naturalist interpreters to our national parks and other public nature settings. These profes professionals become even more important as children experience less nature in their own neighborhoods. Establish National Conservation Corps to reach diverse communities to actively recruit young people into the conservation professions. Replicate wonderful programs like Connecticut's No, Left Child, no, Child, <laughs> no Child Left Inside, or Texas's Life's Better Outside, or Nebraska's Healthy Families Play Outside, uh, to, to um, repopulate our national parks with families. Establish innovative nature attractions, such as the simple canopy walk created by biologist Meg Lohman in Florida, which doubled the attendance of one state park. Develop new grants programs like the U.S. Uh, Forest Service, More Kids in the Woods, that just this week announced their awards to local programs. Encourage national parks to work with and support local child and nature movements work in collaboration with the Departments of Interior, Education, Agriculture, Health and Human Services to help green the nation's, nation's crumbling urban parks. Under the right con conditions, cultural and political change can occur rapidly. The recycling and anti-smoking campaigns are our best examples how social and political pressure can work hand in hand to create a societal societal transformation in just one generation. The Children in Nature movement has perhaps even greater potential because it touches something even deeper within us, biologically, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kellengore, past chairman of the board, American Sport Fishing Association, sir. Thank you. My name is Jerry Callinger, and I'm chairman of Normark Corporation, an international fishing tackle manufacturing company. I'm here today on behalf of the American Sport Fishing Association, the Recreational Fishing Tackle Industries Trade Association, and we appreciate this invitation to testify. 
Recreational fishing has been and remains one of the most popular outdoor activities. Over the last five years, over 80 million Americans have ventured into the outdoors to enjoy fishing. However, we in the industry see several disturbing trends. For many years, the growth in fishing participation followed the growth of our nation's population. But in the mid-1990s, this trend peaked, as you can see on the chart. And since then, fishing popularity has started a slow decline. And our chil children, our children, are following the same trend. According to a report released in February by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the percentage of children introduced to fishing declined from 53% of the population in 1990 to 42% in 2000. The only good news in this report is that it appears that the decline has stabilized in the last few years. Now let me talk a minute about what the recreational fishing community has done to respond to this challenge. In the mid-1990s, we, along with the state boating and fishing managers, recognized the downward trend in participation and asked Congress to respond. As a result, in 1998, Congress passed the Sports Fishing and Boating Safety Act. This act required the Secretary of the Interior to implement a national outreach plan to address these concerns. The Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, the RBFF, was created to carry out the mission. Today, RBFF has eight years of experience in developing an effective outreach program for boating and fishing. I've had the pleasure of serving on the RBF Board of Directors, and with the experience, I can say the organization is ahead of the curve in thinking about kids, the outdoors, as well as thinking about kids and families. In fact, RBFF created Take Me Fishing, the ad campaign, which is also, by the way, a call to action. You can see it on the chart. And who is making this call to action? The children, of course. It's the children who are saying, take me fishing. RBFF has also created a unique website directed at connecting families to the fishing and boating experiences. And I would urge you to take a close look at takemefishing.org, see figure four, for the breadth of where to and how to information. And also they have assembled the education that surrounds introducing kids to fishing in a series of best practices. We've learned that one day or a half day fishing events just aren't enough. You can't introduce a child to fishing one Saturday in May and create a lifetime love of angling in the outdoors. It takes time and it takes repetition. And as a father of three and nine grandchildren, I can tell you it takes a lot of time and a lot of worms. Further RBFF research has shown that being good stewards of our resources comes through great interaction. A child who thinks the river is cool is one thing. A child who thinks the river is cool and fishes it has a greater experience and a greater desire to participate in the sport and a greater awareness and concern of resource stewardship. Finally, one of the most important things you've learned along the way is that the way fishing was taught to our generation is not the way fishing is taught to chil the children of today. If you're under the age of 35, the odds are high that neither your parent nor your grandparent introduced you to angling. In a recent survey of avid anglers, among those whose dads introduced them to fishing, 88% were 35 or older. The majority of those under 35 are being introduced, introduced by someone else. Mr. Chairman, the world has changed and the children have changed, so we, would, we shouldn't be surprised that the activities they participate in are changing. Our old model, the one I grew up with, where parents and grandparents introduce their kids to the outdoors is broken, or at least is not working as well as it once did. If we as a society want to reconnect our children with nature, we need to develop a new model. Many parts of this model are outlined in Richard Lewis' book, The Last Child in the Woods. But one part of the model that receives little attention is the role that federal and state resource management, along with everyone else involved, will have to take the credo that if we build it, they will come and revise it. They believed, and for years it was true, that if we properly managed our natural resources, the public would come to enjoy them. However, the testimony I'm hearing today, I don't think that's true anymore. So I believe the job that we all have to be involved in, and must change, is we must work to ensure healthy, abundant natural resources, and they must also design programs and policies that encourage and engage the public in enjoying those resources. Our nation future depends on it. 
Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, sir. And, uh, next is uh, Mr. Richard Dolish, uh, Director of Public Policy, National Recreation and Park Association, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to members of the committee for the invitation to be here. I'm the Director of Public Policy for the National Recreation and Park Association, but I worked 30 years in parks and recreation, began my career as a park naturalist, and eventually came to manage and develop nature programs and nature interpretation facilities, manage natural area parks. I've had extensive experience working with kids and teens and park visitors of all ages. We believe that connecting children to nature and the outdoors always has been a core mission of public parks and recreation. Sometimes public parks and recreation seen as the provider of ball fields and athletic fields, but we're all about providing a connection to nature and to our public lands. However, it's become evident in recent years that both children and their parents have begun to lose touch with nature and the outdoors. In fact, this trend is reaching crisis proportions among some age groups, and we're really in danger of losing a whole generation of kids who have lost that essential connection with the values and rewards that nature and the outdoors bring. These fears are not unfounded. This trend is of great concern to the members of the National Recreation and Park Association. It's abundantly clear to us that the federal government has an essential and continuing role to play in connecting kids to nature. Our extensive system of national parks and federal public lands is the envy of the world. It's admired throughout the world. But how many kids really can have that national public lands or national park experience? Go to a campfire-led program by a ranger or take a nature hike with a uh, national park ranger. While it can be a transforming experience for children and adults alike, there are really very few who get to have that experience. There are millions of kids, however, who are becoming disconnected with nature and don't have that opportunity to go to a national park. In many ways, our state and local parks our urban parks and our regional parks are the answer. NRPA recently sent out a survey uh, to public park and recreation agencies to learn what programs and facilities the public sector is providing to connect kids with nature and the outdoors. We uh, sent it to about 2,000 agencies and about uh, 250 to 300 responded. Among the, we're still analyzing the data, but among the findings, 68% of local, municipal, regional, public park and recreation agencies provide nature programs for the public. That means that one-third, fully one-third, don't. The most successful nature-based programs by agency measures were nature-based education programs in cooperation with local schools, followed by nature-based summer camps and uh, nature day camps. 61% of the public park and recreation agencies surveyed had nature-based parks and facilities, such as nature centers, outdoor classrooms, or self-guided nature trails. However, that means that 40% of public park and recreation agencies responding had no such nature facilities. Interestingly, over 74% of public park and recreation agencies used, utilized public-private partnerships for nature activities. 53% had partnerships with the private sector to manage parks and operate facilities. Tellingly, 91% of agencies that were not offering nature-based programs declared they would do so if they had adequate funding for ava uh, available for staff and additional resources. 80% of agencies said they were interested in opening new nature-based facilities if funds were available. You know, some of these preliminary findings are surprising that one-third of public park and recreation agencies offer no nature-based programs at all, show that there could be significant gaps and opportunities for parents and children to connect with nature through close-to-home park and recreation facilities. Of equal concern is that 40 percent of public park and recreation agencies didn't have nature-based parks or facilities. However, there was good news in this survey results. We found that, although admittedly from a small sample of a fraction of the total number of local park and recreation agencies, uh, we learned that these 250 agencies alone had more than 1.3 million children under the age of 13 who participated in nature-based programs in 2006, and that their programs also served 170,000 teenagers. And even if 40 percent of these 250 agencies had no dedicated nature parks, the remaining agencies who responded had more than 350,000 acres public land devoted primarily to nature. We believe at the heart of the challenge to connect kids to nature is a connection to parks and public lands. Children must be able to have safe access to parks and public lands, and the importance of such a connection to the land cannot be overestimated. 
We've come to see that having close to home access to nature and parks is vital to kids establishing and maintaining a lifelong connection to nature and the outdoors. You know, the effort to connect kids to the outdoors and to come to love nature, though, is uh, one that, in which the challenges shouldn't be minimized. We continue to ask ourselves, how do we get a generation of kids interested in nature if their parents may not even be interested in nature? Or worse, fearful of turning them loose to go exploring in fields, forests, and wetlands like we used to. In fact, in discussions with nature and program facility managers, I found them to be quite perplexed about how to deal with the perception of safety issue. Many think it's far safer for kids to play in natural areas than to be on the streets or perhaps cruising the internet. But the perception of the lack of safety is real and it can create fear. We jokingly suggested perhaps we need dog parks for kids where parents can turn their kids loose to turn over rocks and streams and go exploring and feel completely at ease about their safety. All joking aside, there's a significant and important role that the federal government plays in enabling kids to connect with nature. The Land and Water Conservation Fund State Assistance Program is a perfect example of how the Department of Interior can play a vital role in connecting kids to nature. Since the beginning of this program, over $4 billion and 41,000 projects have been aided with local and state governments. So one federal program that buys land, protects it in perpetuity, and makes it available for the public. Just to give you an idea, in the last seven years, there have been 3,300 Land and Water Conservation Fund projects at over a half billion dollars of federal assistance matched by a half billion dollars of local government assistance. Of these 800 had uh, directly had nature uh, related activities, programs, or facilities. There's other programs too. The Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program of the National Park Service Technical Assistance Program that helps local communities build greenways, trails, parks, heritage tourism. Uh, the Urban and Park and Recreation Recovery Act, which hasn't been funded for four years vital to connecting the hardest to serve, hardest to reach kids. Uh, I've given you a uh, prepared testimony with many examples of local land and water uh, fund projects, many in your own districts. I urge you to consider looking at that and see what the Land and Water Conservation Fund has done for I'm your communities and your states. If I may, sir, I'm going to have to ask you. Yes, sir. I'm glad to close. We won't meet this challenge unless we're prepared to take bold action. This should be a new a national priority for us, and you are uniquely positioned to do something meaningful about it. We stand ready with a host of private sector, uh, nonprofit, educational institutions to deliver with the federal government agencies and the federal investment. And we thank you for your help and the opportunity to do this. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Dale Penny, uh, CEO, Student Conservation Association. Mr. Penny, I, I understand you have a guest that I you do, will sir. yield some time to and introduce for. I, I will, Thank I will, you. I will do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Dale Penny. I'm president of the Student Conservation Association, or SCA, and I want to thank you for inviting Jeremy Byler, uh, a student member of SCA, um, and me to be here today to speak about one successful and sustaining model of getting young people connected to the outdoors. SCA's mission for the past half century has been to connect young people to our natural world and through meaningful hands-on service, create the next generation of conservation leaders. SEA was started by a young woman still in college who saw the need to engage young people in helping preserve national parks. And since then, nearly 50,000 high school and college age students have volunteered through SEA to provide over 26 million hours of service in America's parks, forests, and public lands in all 50 states. The results of these efforts has not only been an enormous benefit to the environment and the agencies, but it has also attracted and inspired thousands of young people to form a lifelong connection with the natural world and for many of them uh, to pursue conservation careers. In fact, the National Park Service uh, reports in an informal survey that about 10 percent of its field staff employees were Student Conservation Association alumni. Key to SCA success over these 50 years has been that we've operated as a genuine uh, public-private partnering organization with the public land management agencies through a cooperative agreement. SCA and each agency share a commitment and work together to accomplish a, co a critical public purpose, to preserve this nation's natural and historical heritage while attracting and preparing the next generation of conservation stewards. Today, as we've heard, the need to engage young people with nature is more acute than ever. As this nation becomes more diverse and more urban, 
it's essential that our federal agencies reach out in new ways to embrace new populations and make the experience on public lands more relevant to diverse backgrounds and that the agencies themselves become more representative of the changing face of our nation. Here's some of what I've learned about youth and nature through SCA. First, young children find real joy in nature when introduced in a fun way and especially when they see role models of high school students and college students leading them and enjoying the outdoors. The older youth act as a sort of a Pied Piper in a way that older adults just can't. Second, children connect with and learn more from nature when they're engaged in fun, hands-on activities to protect the land, whether that be trail building or tree planting or gardening. This touches something deep within them and changes their relationship to that place. And finally, when young people are actively engaged in, in exploring and giving back to the land, they leave the environment healthier, but they also realize more of their personal potential, develop the ethics and commitment to become engaged citizens, proponents for protecting our public lands, and active conservation voters. Therefore, I have three specific recommendations for these committees in order to overcome some administrative barriers and enhance the value of nonprofit partners working with federal agencies. One, explicitly authorize the Departments of Interior and Agriculture to enter into cooperative agreements with nonprofits that engage young people in voluntary conservation service learning experiences on our public lands, especially those organizations that actively reach out to diverse populations. Cooperative agreements are the appropriate legal instrument to memorialize the respective roles the Federal Land Management Agency and the nonprofit partners have in accomplishing this public purpose. Number two, encourage the bureaus to develop more programs in partnership with nonprofits in which high school and college age young people serve as role models for outreach and education of young children, such as the Junior Ranger Program, which is administered by the National Park Service and SCA members participate in as, as ambassadors. And third, with appropriate youth serving nonprofits such as SCA, open the door for our young people to qualify for entry level jobs within the interior and agricultural uh, bureaus. These actions would enable us as nonprofits to be more effective partners with the land management agencies and attract a more diverse new generation of young conservation professionals who will in turn inspire and engender a love for the outdoors with many more children through environmental education, outdoor adventure, and hands-on experience in nature. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. But as you mentioned, um, I actually have two of our current students that are here with us today. I want to introduce first is Monica Baltimore back here, and then Jeremy Byler is going to say a few words about his experience. Maybe he can say more than all of us have been able to say about this so far. Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished representatives, my name is Jeremy Byler, and I have the lofty task of representing the youth bracket <laughs> that we're talking about. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm a senior at the School Without Walls Senior High School here in the district. I've been involved with the Student Conservation Association for four years, and I've been on two of the organization's month-long summer cruise, one in Yellowstone National Park and another in the White Mountains of Alaska. In the four years that I've been involved with SCA, I have gone through considerable growth. The experience has opened my eyes to a world much larger than the D.C. metropolitan area. I am a strong believer in the, in the power of experiential learning and have many stories that have impacted my life. The one that sticks out the most to me is my first Student Conservation Association summer crew to Yellowstone back in 2004. Before this trip, I was an incredibly shy and timid person who was hesitant to talk in public or try anything new. But I came out of the experience as an outspoken and passionate advocate for conservation. The experience of being away from my family and familiar surroundings taught me a greater independence and has allowed me to finally begin speaking my thoughts and passions instead of just holding them inside. The crew members become a supportive family of friends that encourages and teaches one another, learns from each other, and fosters growth and development in each of its members. 
If not for this experience, designing and building bridges, camping 15 miles away from a dirt road, roughing it out in the wild for a month, and gaining confidence from a supportive crew, I would not psychologically be able to get up in front of a group of people, let's say members of Congress, and speak my mind. Since returning from Yellowstone, I've become an avid uh, public speaker, and I've spoken at the Conservation Learning Summit among leaders in the National Park Service and other conservation organizations. And I was on a pa panel at the DC Green Festival in 2006, discussing the importance of youth in conservation. Due to my experiences with the Student Conservation Association, I have grown as a leader and passionate advocate in the conservation field. Strictly because of my involvement in, with SCA, I have now devoted my life to conservation. In fact, in the fall, I will be pursuing, I'll begin pursuing a degree in civil and environmental engineering at Bucknell University. As I continue to grow in this next stage of my life, I feel confident that the independence and the awe-inspiring wonder that I experience through my summer cruise will continue to act as catalysts for the journey. SCA sent me out and reconnected this kid with the outdoors, and I am forever changed because, because of it. I strongly wish this experience for any and every youth across the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and I appreciate your, uh, your comments. Uh, if it weren't for the protocol, I'd probably ask you to continue to chair this meeting as the <laughs> president. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Alan Lambert, a Scout Executive, National Capital Area Council. Sir, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to come today um, and discuss with you one of the most challenging issues that we face in the healthy development of our children. Regardless of where we grew up, most of us remember a much different childhood than the youth of today. Unstructured outdoor play was a significant part of our early childhood. For us suburban and urban kids, mom's rule to come home when the streetlights came on was the time boundary we had. Vacant lots became the frontier. Forts and tree houses were built in open spaces. Games, stickball, softball, dodgeball, football, capture the flag, kick the can, tag, you name it, were the order of the day. The games had no adult supervision and were put together by groups of kids playing. Members needed to be recruited, the rules were set, and off we went. We played and played, forgetting the pressures of the day, learning to resolve our conflicts, and in most cases, coming home slightly after the street lights went out. Somewhere along the way, we've forgotten the importance of unstructured play in the healthy development of our children's lives. The incredible discoveries that are found in a stream or an open field are being replaced by surf surfing the web. The healthy competitions found in the games of my childhood were, are being replaced by the individual competition found in the gaming world. Play has become organized and structured. Everything has a time and a place, a need for sign-ups, mom or dad's help, and transportation. Come home when the street lights come on has been replaced by a schedule of activities to participate in, much like school or, the word, or by the words entertain yourself, which to today's youth means something electronic. The result is a loss of imagination and the skyrocketing health issues associated with youth obesity and behavior. Was the energy that we burned playing each day a result of ADD or ADHD, or did play provide the therapy for the restless active youth of my day? The Boy Scouts of America has been an outlet for the energies of boys for almost 100 years. Established by Congressional Charter, our mission is to instill values in young people, helping them to achieve their fullest potential. The classroom we use for character development is the outdoors. The founder of scouting, Lord Robert Baden-Powell, observed the youth of London using military training manuals as part of their play. He felt that if these youth, usually poor inner city youth without structure at home, were excited by what they read in these manuals, he could design a program that focused them on outdoor skills, fitness, and fun. In the process, they also learned a code to live by, to be responsible and disciplined, and the importance of being self-reliant. American naturalist Dan Beard and Ernest Thompson Seton saw the possibilities of combining a love of the outdoors with Baden Powell's plan and helped design the core of the programs we use today. The results are impressive. Since 1910, over 100 million youth have experienced the fun and adventure of scouting in America. 
Almost all of them participate in this core outdoor programs, camping, hiking, conservation, and learning the skills to protect and enhance the natural environment around us. In 2006, more than one million youth experienced long-term outdoor camping programs. We operated 404 scout summer camps across America, and many millions more participated in short-term weekend camping and hiking programs throughout the year. I represent the National Capital Area Council, which serves the youth and families of 16 counties in Maryland and Virginia, plus the District of Columbia. In that territory, we serve over 85,000 youth in our programs. The core of our strategy is to implement the mission of scouting through the outdoors. We've taken this responsibility seriously. In 1996, our council acquired the property that Disney had targeted to become a Northern Virginia theme park. Located less than 50 miles west of the capital near Haymarket, Virginia, this property was perfect for our mission. After a period of planning and development and an investment of $18 million, we opened the property for full programming last year. When fully operational, Camp William B. Snyder will allow us to expose thousands of youth to the fun and adventure of the outdoors. We also operate Goshen Scout Reservation, a 3,500-acre traditional scout camp located near Lexington, Virginia. Since 1966, Goshen has been a place where thousands of youth have learned to camp, cook their first meal, participate in a conservation project, and have fun. Besides the periods of instruction, everything that happens at camp is aimed at fun with a purpose. Couple our local efforts with those of our national office, places like Philmont Scout Ranch, the Florida Sea Base, and the Northern Minnesota Canoe Base, the Boy Scouts of America have committed to using the outdoors as a platform to develop, help develop healthy children. But the story doesn't stop there. All across America, Scouts use public lands as part of their program. From local community parks to our nation's largest forest, Scouts connect their inside learning with outside applications. Fun with a purpose has practical educational meaning. And the impact on fitness is also huge. Prepare for a 25-mile hike at 10,000 feet in the mountains of New Mexico carrying a 40-pound backpack. You'll learn the definition of fitness real quick. So why is this important? Why should we be discussing some fun childhood memories here in Congress? Interestingly, our success with connecting youth with nature has a direct impact on many of the issues we wrestle with today. Let me offer you some examples. First, the issue of youth fitness is the most obvious and most pressing to today's healthcare debate. From, if you th uh, think sports programs are the answer, from 1981 to 1997, youth participation in organized sports increased by 27% across America. It's ironic that the childhood uh, obesity issue has uh, coincided with this increase. One wonders if the strict schedules and lack of unsupervised play are more the issue. Access to parks, public lands, and outdoor programs are certainly part of the solution. Next, consider the availability of individuals interested in science, technology, and math. As we continue to structure our lives, we take away the most potent tool in our toolbox, fostering their imagination, innovation, and dreams. Connecting with nature and allowing unstructured playtime provide a tremendous and proven method for sparking an interest in, in America's lifelong pursuit. Last, I believe the outdoors provides us with a platform for our great partnerships between government, business, educators, and parents. There are few places that can effectively bring this large group together. Whether for social or educational purposes, our outdoor resources are places that people can gather. Strategic partnerships can be created to link with schools and parks and camps to teach science and math in the outdoors, presenting these subjects in a totally different light, fun with a purpose. Almost 100 years ago, when asked what makes a good scout leader. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap um, it up. Last sentence. Robert Baden Powell thought a moment and said, a good leader of youth is someone who can find adventure in a mud puddle. As we debate the issues that confront us, let us always be mindful that our children need places to play, to dream the dreams that will take us to new places and learn to be good stewards of our open spaces entrusted to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me uh, begin. Uh, some questions. Let me begin begin with uh, Ms. Uh, Perchuk. Uh, I'm going to be a couple of questions, and also I'm beginning with you because you you stuck to the five minute rule. Uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> in, uh, 
In, in your testimony, you, you suggested and, uh, the federal agency might want to consider the establishment of a Youth Conservation Corps. Yes. yes. And uh, to recruit young people, to yes. get people to participate. Could you elaborate just a little bit well, more on that? Well, I know How do there you see are it working. Yeah, yeah, I know that there are recruitment programs in place now. But I think what we need to do is look beyond what we have traditionally thought of as recruitment. Um, at, for example, college campuses. When I think of recruitment, uh, I think of the opportunities that someone like Gina McCarthy is creating in Connecticut. Families that are turned on in a very holistic way to nature. We should be recruiting at that point as well. Um, there are other sort of innovative ways of thinking about recruitment in general. If we're talking about a generation that is really going to care and take care of and be stewards for the lands, I would go so far as to say that we should be recruiting uh, future stewards in nature preschools. That, that we cannot think that we are going to find the students in colleges that are turned on by this. We have to start earlier. So. At every stage of development, children need to understand that there is a potential for them to participate uh, both personally and professionally in conservation and land stewardship. Excuse me. Uh, thank you very much. And the last point you made goes to the point that Congressman Sarbanes was, was yes. making yes. about uh, how we connect the very important public education function with the very important subject that we're talking about here today and yeah. maybe recruitment is one of those areas as well. Last uh, quick question if I may. Uh, you suggested federal and state uh, agencies should loosen up the use of funds for outreach efforts and uh, what do you mean by? Well I up? think that um, they t we talk about funds being used for um, uh, for the maintenance and um, uh, care of our lands. And we don't take uh, into account the fact that we need to care for those people that are going to enjoy those lands as well. I think we need to expand the definition of what healthy land uh, management is and land use is and try and combine those and expand the ability for us to fund programs that not only educate but bring families and children into the parks. I think that that would be a really good direction to see this go in. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Caligore, you were in, in your, at the end of your statement you mentioned that state and federal fish and wildlife agencies uh, perhaps spend too much time on managing fish and wildlife resources and perhaps not enough time in attracting the public to enjoy these resources. Uh, what do you think is needed in that regard? And uh, well, I, I, your campaign, Take Me Fishing, is a very good example of the kind of attracting people to the resources. But what did you mean in general about the agencies, just to well, clarify I think, that? Mr. Chairman, I think that what we should do is to, to break down any barriers that are there that prevent uh, people from entering the world of fishing, angling, and consequently the outdoors. I think that we should take a long, hard look at how we treat licenses and how they're issued. And I think that fr from my point of view, coming from manufacturing, look at it as a, m do a better job of marketing this through the group where we have all this electronic data to date from the licenses, and we should be able to go and meet um, and contact each and every licensed uh, recipient and uh, resell him on the fact that uh, programs are available for them to reposition themselves and, and possibly address a, a program, and this is just off the top of my head, where we could, we're losing fishermen, uh, the older fishermen, and maybe there could be a two-year license at a rate or whatever, and all of these things have to be monitored as far as cash flow and things are concerned. But I think we should be looking out of the box a little bit. Thank you. Mr. Dolish, uh, Quick question before my time runs up. Uh, some are, some are going to argue, and some do argue, that, that states and localities should pay for the land and open space for recreation, and that uh, the federal role should be minimal, minimal at best. Uh, what do you think, uh, why do you think, and in your testimony you talked specifically about two funding sources that have been either frozen, cut, or are not funded, 
but uh, why do you think the federal government involvement in these efforts is, is so vital and important? Well, Mr. Chairman, the federal government cares about investing in education and transportation and urban development and public safety. And when have we stopped caring about investing in our kids' future and connecting them to our public lands? Uh, the funding source for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, as you know, is the conservation royalties that come from the offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, vastly undertapped amount of money that's been devoted to that purpose but rarely appropriated by Congress. Uh, the unmet need is incredible. There, uh, the, the National Park Service estimates the unmet need of states and localities. In each uh, five years, NRPA does a capital investment survey. It's in the tens of billions of dollars of, of land that public park and recreation agencies need to buy and want to buy. Um, there is far more need than there are quality public lands for people to have close to home access. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Ginsburg, if I could start with you, because I apologize that I missed your actual testimony. I was having some unstructured time outside <laughs> at the moment. So if I can ask you some specific questions about obesity rates in, this, in the research you've done. Is there a difference between urban and rural, uh, obesity rates between urban and rural areas? Um, I know that I can't comment on the exact difference. I could get that to you. I can tell you that in urban America, we know that obesity rates are particularly skyrocketing right. among impoverished populations. That we know. All right. So I don't, I, actually, I don't need specifics, but if you just give me those general areas, I appreciate that. How about between the East and the West of the nation? Um, I don't have that data right now. Is obesity in any way class related? Obesity is definitely related to poverty and to chronic stress. Are there also social and cultural issues that relate to obesity? I, you know, crime is a deterrent, latchkey kids, single parent families, et cetera. We know that under-resourced kids are less likely, less likely to be able to go out and explore the world on their own because they don't have, a, you know, their, their adults are needing to watch them very closely. The communities may not be safe. So we know that in areas of poverty, a major barrier to outdoor exploration is the fact that the world may not be safe and there may not be enough adults to watch the kids because they're working one you, or two jobs. Yeah, I appreciate that again. You, you also said many school children are given less free time and fewer physical outlets at schools. Why do you think schools are cutting back in that area? It's hard for me to comment on that, but it's clear that um, recently there's been a greater attention to the fundamentals of reading and writing and that many of the other issues, excuse me, in math, um, and that many of the other issues around art, music, physical education, and those other things are being cut down severely. We know that in general, if we look at sixth grade, for example, we know that about 13 percent of sixth graders have no recess at all. However, if you look at people in the lowest poverty rate, that becomes 34 percent of sixth graders have no recess at all. So in those schools that serve our poorest kids, those kids have the fewest resource re, um, recess as well as the um, lowest exposure to physical education classes. You, know, you could have won me if you'd said history as part of those that are being, you know. Love history. Okay, that's much better then. Thank you. All right. You're learning. Ms. Perchik, if I could ask a question. In your written testimony, you talk about environmental groups like Sierra Club uh, beginning programs to get children outdoors. I think it's uh, building bridges to the outdoors or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Do you know how much money groups like the Sierra Club or the Sierra Club is putting that outdoor activity? Oh, I wish I did. I don't have that information. I can get it for you. All right, thank you. I, I, yeah. That would be very helpful if we okay. could do that at the same time. Uh, Sierra Club, uh, Trust for Public Land, a lot of uh, uh, National Wildlife Federation now has a program that they're targeting in this area as well. I think of the testimony that Boy Scouts gave of what they're doing as far as this effort, if these organizations could put more of that type of commitment to those areas, we could see the private sector taking up a big slack in some of these uh, programs that are there. Jeremy, I appreciate your testimony. Um, I certainly hope you don't think that testifying before Congress was one of the highlights. <laughs> if you are, you missed the educational value. It was there. But I thank you for being here, and I appreciate the comments that were there. Mr. Dulles, you, you just said that Land, uh, Water, and Conservation Fund is, is funded partially by the oil and gas receipts for offshore drilling. Uh, does your group support then increasing the drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf to get more money for these programs? Sir, we, uh, in, we supported the expansion of Area 181 last year, the proposal to allow 12.5 percent of those royalties to go to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's a direct investment in conservation and recreation for all American people. 
uh, from the royalties of that expanded drilling. Uh, uh, did I hear a yes in there? We didn't take a position to say we support expanded drilling. We said if you're going to drill, just as when the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act was authorized in 1965, there ought to be a permanent benefit for conservation and recreation as it was done 40 years ago. Mr. Dulles, I'm going to submit for the record, if I might, if I ask unanimous consent to add uh, this chart that was prepared by the, uh, good, have good grief, who were they, this somebody, prepared by Center for Disease Control that relates the, uh, I'm sorry. Without objection. Thank you, sir. That relates uh, the obesity rates to different sections of the country. And it clearly illustrates here that there is a regional pattern in obesity rates. In fact, if you look over that, the one that has the federal land ownership, the area of the United States, everything in blue is how much of that state's owned by the federal government. Um, joy of joys for those of us in the West. But you see the areas with the heavy blue are not necessarily the areas with the most obesity issues, which simply means, is there, are you saying, can you say there is a connection between federal land and obesity, or are you saying there's a connection between public land and obesity? You know, it's a- And you got 30 seconds, because I'm over, well, I apologize. It's a very tantalizing question. The state of Georgia is analyzing this very data in their, lo their state uh, recreation planning. Uh, it's, the issue is the more to how, close is the access to home? How can you get to places where you can get healthy and stay fit? And that's the key to solving the issue of connecting kids to nature and the outdoors. So the, then the key area is those areas that are having problems with obesity in some situation are the ones in which the, the land situation needs to be the most accurate, which doesn't, this map does not relate in there, correlate in any way to that map. So there when we talk about public land, we're not necessarily talking about federal land, we're talking about all public land, state, localities, and those types of things. We believe there's an important okay. connection to it. I have just one more comment, but I'll wait until I have an extra shot at this. Okay. Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I thank the witnesses for coming and giving testimony. And, and I, this is kind of a, a new concept, I believe, and so um, it's been an educational issue for me. As a boy, I was raised on a farm. And my back door neighbor was the Francis Marion National Forest, which was 250,000 acres. And, uh, and so I still have that farm today, and I still enjoy going out there and communing with nature and riding that tractor and cutting that grass and, you know, fishing those ponds. And, uh, you know, my grandchildren have access to that. And so I think it's a, it's a good notion. And I'm just trying to, I guess, put in my mind exactly how we can expand that so more people can be inclusive because it really is a, a good life. Uh, you know, I've gained a few pounds since then, but back in those days, we always had enough chores to keep us, uh, you know, pretty occupied and I uh, guess keep that uh, obesity from setting in. But uh, anyway, just to get a little bit of information about what's happening in uh, what is a nature park? I know we said we need to expand our regular parks and include a nature park. And tell me what difference just a regular, we got lots of parks down our way and I guess I'm trying to decide how it qualifies and what what is the what what amenities do you have that uh, would set them apart from just a regular park, sir? The, uh, a nature-based facility is one that invites the public in to explore nature and experience it on its own terms. It might have a nature trail. It might have interpretive information. There might be staff assigned, a visitor center, a nature center, a nature museum. All of these are ways that people can experience nature. But you know the best teacher is nature itself. We believe that if you can connect kids to nature, it's inherently interesting to them, and just the opportunity to do so. So any park can qualify as a nature park. What, what we actually did was we, we, we have what we call a Palmetto Trail. You know, we're pretty protective. You know, South Carolina is the Palmetto State, right? And so we call it the Palmetto Trail. It's, a, it's really a hiking trail that actually goes from the ocean to the mountains, which we enjoy both in South Carolina. And, and so I guess that would be considered a nature, part of a nature park, since it goes through not only public lands, but private lands too, in order to make that, make that track. But a lot of it tracks the national forest lands, but some you know, private lands are in between too. And so, uh, okay. And I was just interested in, in Jeremy's testimony. I thought that was a pretty good testimony to, uh, you know, to prove that, that communing with nature is certainly some benefit. 
And I was just wondering how many people are in that particular program that Jeremy was participating in. And uh, uh, yes, sir. Each year we put uh, about 3,000 uh, interns into into uh, working with all the federal land management agencies and state land management agencies all over the all over the the country. In addition, we have about a thousand young people that are in the, the high school program that, that starts, that provides a continuum of, of uh, opportunities from urban parks all the way through the federal lands. And, uh, and then through them, they extend that to tens of thousands of other young people that have that opportunity. Um, I might also say that we do a variety of internships, including uh, one of our interns has been in your office, uh, Congressman, uh, uh, and uh, we appreciate I that. I think he's going to afford something next. That's something. right. Uh, yep. And learning about uh, policies uh, in, the, in the congressional offices and then going to a national park and learning about the practical uh, resource management. Well, I can tell you that's, uh, you know, that, that young man, I could see a real growing experience with him as he came in and, and had a chance just to kind of interact with the uh, with our staff and with me, and I think it was a growing experience. In fact, we have a plan, a program too, that we develop in Charleston, as part of the Tall Ship Program, right. where we uh, we 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 have in what they call the spirit of South Carolina. It's it's just about in its final you know build out, and uh, that that will be a similar type program, except it'll be at sea rather than it be, I guess, on land. So, uh, well, I commend you for uh, addressing this effort and trying to bring new opportunities to youth that, that's really a disadvantage. But uh, right. anyway, thank you all for coming and being part of this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. And let me, some quick follow-ups. I know Mr. Bishop asked some other questions as well, perhaps Mr. Brown as well. Uh, Dr. Ginsburg, when you, when you were uh, elaborated a little bit for us, the differences between uh, participation in organized sports and the kind of un unorganized, creative uh, outdoor play that you, you were discussing in your testimony today, and, and what are the benefits to both? Right. We want to be clear. We are not against organized sports. Organized sports are great ways of kids to work together, to learn about leadership, to work with adults, and to be supervised by adults. But what we want is for kids to have some unscheduled free time to be able to explore their own areas of interest. What an organized sport allows you to do is spend a couple, times of, a couple of hours a day working on a specific issue, and then you're likely to maybe go home and uh, spend time in screen time or doing homework. What the outdoors allows you to do is uh, not only explore the world and to explore your own creativity and to find your own interest, to find who you are in the context of the environment, but it also is constant movement. We have a situation right now where kids are so deeply scheduled from one activity to another, inclusive of organized sports, but also perhaps tutoring and uh, music lessons and other things. Kids are so overscheduled right now that one of the mantras we hear from kids all day long is, I'm bored, I have nothing to do. And what stimulates them is to turn to screen time, to the Game Boys and to the other activities. We believe that as long as there are clouds in the sky, as long as there are trees, as long as there are birds, as long as you can turn over a rock and find an ecosystem, there's no reason to be bored. The interaction with nature allows you to be constantly moving, constantly playing. That has a real impact on not only physical health, we keep talking about obesity, but please let's not forget about stress and emotional health and the connection with nature that that's going to help with. Thank you, and I appreciate the clarification because uh, I, your point is, is, should be noted. It, this is not an issue of against organized sports. It's, an, it's, a, it's a call for balance. A little bit we of balance. balance. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Penny, you were, uh, your testimony was excellent descriptions of the benefits of SCA partnerships with the federal government, how good it is for the, for the young people involved and how good it is for the receiving agency that gets the benefit of their talent. And, but, but you also seem to indicate that there are some arrangement problems. Uh, what is the problem with the current arrangement and what would you recommend in terms of fostering those private public, nonprofit public relationships? Uh, yes, sir. The, the, uh, we feel that the, uh, the very best 
uh, way for nonprofits to work with uh, the agencies is, is through what's called a cooperative agreement. And the, at the heart of the cooperative agreement is not a contractual arrangement, but it is a way to share, it's a shared commitment to uh, improve the land and, in, and enhance the, enrich the experience of the young person. And that's the way it's worked with us. And particularly with us, uh, with every time we, we place a, a young person uh, with a federal agency, they pay, the agency pays about 80 percent of the costs, and SCA makes a cash match of getting private individuals through philanthropic support to invest in uh, public lands um, by supporting that young person. So the value of that is that it's, it benefits the young person, it benefits the agency, it leverages federal dollars with private dollars. And um, there is some concern uh, of that, uh, uh, and understandably so. We don't want um, uh, agencies using these to uh, just get cheap labor, and that is not the point. Uh, a cooperative agreement requires that it's not that. that it's You're not supplanting a, another function. They're not supplanting another function. They're together working for a higher purpose. Thank you. That Important point. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. I don't. I don't have a question, but I. I. I, I do want to go uh, to to the points that you were ma you were making. I think uh, and give you an example of the the dealt with the Boy Scouts. I think last Congress we passed legislation for Valle Vidal to protect Valle Vidal from uh, gas and and oil development, uh, and the Boy Scouts were an important part of that legislation because the ranch is nearby. The activities uh, of the, of the young people that participate in there, and and I think that's a good example of a private public protect a, a forest area that was very important. A lot of great natural resources, got a great outdoor activities for people, and uh, those are the kinds of encouragements. And I just wanted to acknowledge that because uh, your organization was had a great deal to do with. Uh, convincing many of us that that was the right way to go. Thank you, sir. We're, uh, we're the stewards of a lot of uh, land in America, and we have to pass it on to future generations, so that partnership's important to us. Thank you. Before I close, is there any questions? Let me just do a couple. I, I appreciate the gentleman from Arizona. It, it, great minds must go there, because the first two questions you ask are two I had, so thank you for those. Just trying to cut in our time. Yeah, well, we got done earlier. Let me just make uh, a couple of points, if I could, just at the very end of this of this hearing. Uh, first, I, I appreciate this hearing on obesity issues. I just want you all to know that when the big famine hits, I'm going to be the last one to go, so there. But there are a couple of things, especially for this panel, I'd like to keep in mind. Number, and there are only about four. Number one is that we tend, when we try to focus in on one issue like this, to look at public lands as simply the recreation for those without public lands. Public lands have a function that's far and indeed more than that. So I don't want us to, to narrow in and lose that, that concept. Secondly, there is always the ability for this issue to be captured by other groups. There are, there are bills that are floating around. I've had groups that come in here who are basically trying to sell recreation stuff. And that now becomes the key element. As they told me, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about real recreation, not having a kid stand out there waiting for somebody to kick the soccer ball to him. Yeah, you want somebody standing out there waiting for somebody to kick the soccer ball to him. There is a third one that I think is very clear here, in that there are some who are talking about what we're about public lands for the concept of obesity and some for the concept of building conservations for the future. And even though we have tied them together in this hearing, those are two separate and distinct concepts that we should not try to marry together because it becomes an unnatural one. F second to the last point, deals with what we're trying to look at as far as federal land ownership versus the need that's out there. And as I think we tried to illustrate with the, the obesity chart from, uh, that, that I put into the record, there is a correlation between need that is not necessarily a direct correlation with federal lands, which means I appreciate you all coming here, but you shouldn't be here. It is possible for you to get the federal government to pass a law to mandate all sorts of activities, and it won't mean diddly squat. It's kind of like when you, when you were talking about cigarette consumption declining. It's not being mandated by the federal government to tell people to quit smoking. It has to be an education issue. 
where they decide to do it themselves because still people are free to make those choices. It has to be in the education, so, uh, education process. And this should be do, you should be doing this in every state capital in major county areas because if they don't buy into it, there is nothing we're going to mandate that's going to make it, that's going to make a bit of difference. The final one I want to do is a very personal one. And it goes to the message that we're giving as we start talking about obesity in kids. And I apologize for taking the time of doing this, but I, and, and this is almost like personal re revelation time. I got to tell it to somebody. You happen to be here, so you're stuck listening to it. I do have a daughter that, that when she was in the third grade, became, uh, had a disease that was extremely rare. And because of that, the medication that she was on bloated her significantly. She was huge. <clears throat> she wasn't fat. She was just big on medication. And I have a number of times the painful experience of having her come back as a small girl in tears because of comments people made about the fat kid. And all I want to know is we go forward with this discussion about obesity. We need to make sure that we are very sensitive in the way you do that. There are a lot of kids out here who are going to be called fat kids as we try to narrow in saying how wrong it is to be slightly overweight. And they're not overweight simply because they're playing games. There are all sorts of factors that are involved in that. And sometime in the rhetoric that we have to try and pass these bills and, and bring this issue, our rhetoric is so terribly insensitive that it hurts kids who are very, very much aware of the situation they're in and our rhetoric in an effort to pass bills or to get more money or anything else is one of those things that actually rips people apart on the inside. And I'm not talking, I mean, I know I'm, I'm not fat. I'm a nutritional overachiever. I've recognized I've grown to live with it. But kids aren't. And sometime in our effort to sell equipment or to get more money or to emphasize a need, we really are insensitive to how we are ripping kids apart on the inside. And so I just want, I want the rhetoric as we go along here to understand that we can do some great harm in our zeal to do a great deal of good. With that, I'll yield back and quit rambling on. And I apologize you had to listen to that. Thank Somebody you. did. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. Being uh, somewhat challenged in the consumption area myself, I would, uh, I, would, I would agree with you that as we go forward, and I don't think we heard it any time in this discussion, or any discussions on, this, on the subject of obesity and what needs to be done, uh, the issue of cruelty. I don't think uh, everybody's aware that there's a great deal of sensitivity in the issue, but there's a great deal of urgency as well to deal with it. And I appreciate your comments. I, uh, thank you very much. This panel in the, uh, has been particularly uh, enlightening and I appreciate it. And, uh, and just to say a couple of things, as we work to reconnect, because I don't think it's connect, I think it's reconnect, uh, families and youth with our great public places and public lands, uh, I, I think we have to keep in sight what the role of government, federal government is going to be. And I believe there is a role. Uh, there is a role, whether it's a role of intervention and creating initiatives and incentives to move forward, uh, whether it's the role of, of assuring that proper funding for our agencies that manage our public lands are there so that outreach and connection efforts can be developed and organized there, I think that is as well. Uh, because we're dealing with quali a quality of life issue that is, is generational, and we seem to be losing that aspect in the, in the generations that are coming up, the connection to our natural places. And we're also dealing with the health issue, both mental and physical. And then there's a the whole underlining issue, which is uh, history and legacy about our public places and the need to conserve them and a new generation of uh, constituents to support and protect those areas. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to continuing to work with this issue with you and uh, appreciate your testimony and the meetings adjourned. Thank you.
And a live picture from Capitol Hill. That is the uh, House Ways and Means Committee room in the Longworth House office building. Nobody in the room at this moment, but shortly a discussion will be getting underway here on the history of the House.